Hey guys, I'm gonna let you guys take it away. Thank you one more time, guys. Give a big warm welcome, guys. We have East, as I said, and Mr. Rarzi, as I said. But first game of today's AAL series, it will be Fryzai and Holy Snoopy. But guys, take it away here. Oh man, so Holy Snoopy just coming in with a hard aggro. He loses his Koish. There won't be any double Synergy Master Lava Wave shenanigans to start us off. But banning an Oshiara from Fry's side means that Tulkin is still pretty happy here. Uh, you know, realistically, there's only a little bit of earth damage and otherwise no electric, no water. Tulkin very, very happy fighting. Leading him with the Gialis, though, it's a little bit strange taking uh, a little bit less aggro of a, of a lead with only that double gash or drill impact on Holy Snoopy's side. Yeah, both players picking up on the sort of anti-aggro trends that we've been seeing the last couple of weeks. We've seen that uh, there's a Gallus, probably a mirroring Gallus on both sides, and the Volarend as well. Those Thames pretty strong into the special attack aggro that we see creeping up in the meta over the last couple of weeks. And we're in second bands now. Gallus banned out, and we'll see what Fryzite selects on Holy Snoopy's side. And no more Gialis for Fryzite. It protects that Volfi just a little bit more. Even uh, a little bit in that Volaren too, as there isn't much in the name of physical damage on Fryzite's team beyond that Gialis. We'd just be looking at the Feather Gatlings from Volaren. Uh, so if Holy Snoopy is able to set up his anaerobic Volaren, get those special defense buffs, could potentially be enough to out-survive and outlast any of these other Thames on Fryzite's side. He's hovering over the Lawali. Come on, my guy! It's the perfect tem. It's not, you know, great into this particular team, but it, it'll do the job you need it to do. I I believe in you, Fryzite. Yes, Luali. <laughs> there we go. It's been a very interesting draft because Fryzite has kind of somehow managed to put themselves in a position where they aren't really comfortable picking Nidrasil, so they are pretty Volfi weak now as a result. Nid is typically a pretty good tem at checking Volfi, but because Snoopy is able to bring um, two of their wins, it won't be the case. As we jump in here, game number one of the Airborne Archipelago League day week two day one, It'll be Holy Snoopy versus Fryzite. Yeah, the double Tolkien lead, the Gialis versus the Volarend heater on Holy Snoopy's side. So Volarend won't be able to do as much damage with a Nox Bomb, uh, but that's not really the point of it, right? It just wants to give itself those special defense buffs. On Snoopy's side, though. Gialis has got to go. He's not very happy, doesn't want to stay, doesn't want to say hi, thanks for dinner. No, it's probably turning into... No, he stays! What? Fiery soul into that Gialis, down to 27% right away. That would have been what I thought would be a nice Mimit swap in, but no, just taking the mirroring damage as it is, hurting the Tolkien as well. And Volaren just going to go for that clean Nox Bomb. It's hitting Gialis. It's resisted. It's not going to accomplish too much more. Yeah, this is the the magic of 40% mirroring damage as we see the Tolkien almost taking as much as the Gialis in that turn. Uh, despite um, Volaren, you know, now sitting pretty at 67% as well. So and over, in terms of overall damage, Snoopy kind of did more. But uh, the Tolkien having access to priority now with Fiery Soul means it can kind of clean up the Gaiala slot, and there isn't a great swap in on Snoopy's side. They can go for their Mimit, like you mentioned before, but it's probably just giving Volarend a little bit too much time to continue to stack up these anaerobic buffs, but we'll see what the two players decide to go for here. Yeah, if it is the Mimit, at the very least, that means that Tolkien can be ignored on Fryzite's side. And really, a double Tolkien on Snoopy, Wolfie's not going to do too much damage right away. Lawali doesn't want anything to do with it. And your cash is also still just neutral damage without the strongest earth techniques in the world. Potentially double Tolkien could just double in on Volarend over and over again and, and get something going. Uh, but it's still it maybe a little bit too much to ask for from Tolkien as those are some pretty stamina intensive techniques. And we saw Volarend, it's already plus one now. It, it only took a little bit of damage from that first attack. It could certainly take three, four more Fiery Souls after it gets itself set up. But no, everybody stays in Fiery Soul towards this Gialis because of the Sharp Stabs. I wonder if that's going to be enough mirroring damage. 18.1% is all it's asking for, and it won't be there. It's just not enough, and we skipped ahead oh, in the guys, video. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, let me go back. I don't know what just happened. I think I clicked on my controller. Guys, forgive me. A little okay. technical difficulties. We're good. We're good. We're good. 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 Okay. There we go. There's an ox bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here. We're here. <laughs> yeah, the, the expected Nox bomb towards the Tolkien. Uh, a little bit of damage now on Snoopy's Tolkien, which is definitely nice for Fryzite. The Volarend is set up pretty nicely, plus two special defense, and still has 67% HP. If he gets it to plus three, plus four, he's going to reach the territory where nobody is doing enough damage to him for it to really matter. And, and that gets pretty scary for Snoopy. I uh, think. I think based on the stamina, we can conclude that Tolkien likely still has Tornado up. Like, it, I don't think it committed Tornado to kill the Tolkien on the other side, right? It would have been a Wind Burst or a Fiery Soul to, to KO the Tolkien. So uh, it's kind of hard for Fryzite to bring anything in um, in place of the Tolkien, right? Like, if this Drakash is not happy eating a Tornado, uh, so it, this is kind of... I wonder if Holy Snoopy is kind of jumping on the ignore Volarend game plan here. Here they go. Yeah, that's definitely, it used to work out pretty well. The Plague doing a perfect 40%, though. OCD approved damage onto this Jerkash. Mud Shower back from 73 down to 35. So that was still some pretty good damage. Followed up by the Wind Burst. Potentially it was a Tornado then, and this Tolkien just has a lot of stamina. Or maybe just wanting to save it for one last hoorah next turn, as it does survive just barely. It would definitely be enough damage to kill this Jerkash, but so would Volfi. Uh, so I wonder if, if this is where Volaren maybe wants to take some of those hits. It's already plus three. Yeah, this is looking like a maybe a potential swap in uh, like the token coming out on Holy Snoopy's side. Volaren seems like a pretty good swap in. If your cash locked in and not able to leave, it's it's pretty much dead to rights to the plague this turn, and token will come out here. And it's going to be the Mimit, actually, so Snoopy decides that they wanted your cash. Uh, so we'll see where this goes from here. I do like Drakash a little bit here. It, uh, you know, fire is still good damage against Volarend. It's not going to be incredible now that it's going to be plus four, uh, but that is a pretty good resist from any Nox Bombs and not going to take too much damage from a Feather Gatling. Uh, you know, potentially it's more for the Lowali, but I I'm not entirely sure because now Volfi is pretty happy just fighting back. We, we just saw Holy Snoopy's Volfi playing very nicely against a Drakash. So, I mean, going back this other way, now Mimit holding on to Drakash's power, keeping it in the game in spirit. We'll, we'll, no, it's just swapping out. It's not going to accomplish too much. Yeah, that, it's an, it was an interesting pivot, maybe trying to reduce damage on the Volarent, and now it comes back in again. Plague will lock in, I assume it's handcuffs, so it'll lock in the Holy Snoopy Volfi. I wonder if they just trade Plague's here. Yeah, it will be a, a, an exchange of plague, um, gross, um, between Thames here, and they're both locked in. So we do see a mirror match, Volarend versus Volarend, and Fryzite opts to rest. Yeah, the Wolfie versus Wolfie fight does slightly favor Fryzite due to the faster plague. Uh, we saw last time it, it did cause the slight overexertion on Snoopy's Wolfie, so that's not really a fight that Snoopy wants to continue to take. But there's not much he can do about it right now. It's likely that Fryzite's just going to double that spot while it's trapped in, do a lot of damage, get his own Volarend up to plus five, and then just wreak havoc. Yeah, I wonder if um, the the main thing that's sort of holding uh, Holy Snoopy back right now is that they can't get the opposing Volarend in a position where their Mimic can copy it. So Feather Gatling, it's an aerobic Volarend. Okay, now we're getting spicy. Yeah, aerobic Vola in the middle of a special attack meta. What is going on? But he's made it work. He's made it to AAL. He's, I believe, uh, performed pretty well in week one. It's, it's, maybe it'll maybe it'll be able to work. I, I'm not entirely sure. This Volarend on Fryzite's side has only thrown out physical attacks so far, and it is minus four special attack, so potentially not too much of a threat from the other Volarend. Meanwhile, Volfi doesn't have effective damage towards Vola, and Lawali would only have the Hypoxia, but he's kind of challenged out by the Tolkien in the back. Oh no! Trying to swap Volfi while trapped in. That is an unfortunate, unfortunate play. Uh, but the HKS does take down Fryzite's Volfi in the meantime, so potentially not game losing as it does still come to a kill. You gotta think that 
Uh, here comes an Oxmon, first of all. This is going to deal pretty good damage into Bulfy, but you got to think this is uh, this is the Lolly now, right? An overexerted Volaron with minus two special defense? Yeah, here it comes. Uh, there's not a lot. With the token low on HP and the Mimit uh, staring down a Volaron, there's pretty much nothing that Snoopy can bring in to deal with Lolly at this point. Yeah, it really is just going to be like a single fiery soul after after one of these other Thames die. Um, I don't know. Volaren's still trapped in. It's kind of difficult. I think that Snoopy needs to have Tolkien in Vola spot and Mimit come in for the Volfi spot in order to accomplish anything there. Uh, Mimit, in, Mimit into a Volaren still is decent. It means that he keeps a little bit of physical pressure for the opposing Volaren as well as not spawn from the Wally. Foxia coming in. This is going to deal a lot of damage. It will secure a KO. Um, here we will see Cell's double screen on the Vola. Feather Guy comes in, takes Mimit pretty low. And now with this Mimit, we will see Tolkien come in. If the Mimit is running Doppelganger Brooch, this actually could work out quite well for, for Holy Snoopy as the classic Kisiwa meta Doppel Voloren has returned to us in a new form. Yeah, but I wonder if if this is just a Feather Gatling plus Fiery Soul towards that Vol... Oh, Fiery Soul's not going to do anything to plus five. So it's going to have to be split damage on Snoopy's side. Even a Doppel on this Mimit, it was just a Drakash. Now it's doing physical instead of the special is it built to do both or is doppel just going to make up for the the lower stats tolkien does fall down though it does some nice damage to lawali before falling victim uh, but in the end it's just not strong enough to hang on yeah doppel is there but it still only brings this vola down to 40 percent and decreases its special defense in the process this might be the fattest hyperkinetic strike we've ever seen uh, since the nerf about to come out of this mimited Volar end, right? The the plus one speed from the aerobic heading into a doppelganger brooch onto the Volar end. It does have plus five special defense, but that is that that's pretty strong. I mean, you got that going for you. This is a very close game. Volfi has the opportunity to maybe stamina trap this Volar end so that it overexerts itself, but the Lawali on the other side uh, having to contend with a mimic. Likely outsped now because of the plus one speed and the Mimit normally being high speed. So look, perhaps the two non Volas will perish this turn. We'll have to see. Yeah, if it comes down to a fight between Lawali and Volfi, even with these low HPs, it probably comes down to this Vol or the Lawali, right? Because Volfi, the plague, I don't think will do 15% to the really high base special defense of Lawali. And meanwhile, Hypoxia towards Volfi doing neutral damage instead of resisted will certainly do 22. So if it were that clean, if it's Volaren fights Vola and Lawali fights Volfi, I think Fryzite is pretty heavily favored in that bout. Yeah, they might be going across here, though, as the plague comes into the Volaren, does lock it in, does trap the stamina. No, but the, the Volaren's not fast enough. Hypoxia strikes and it KOs with the aerobic. That yeah. hand fan Lawali knocking itself out in the process, but you've done me proud, Lawali. And that's enough to secure game one. Fryzite takes it in down to just the last turn there. That was close right to the end. GG's! Yeah, a 1-0 advantage for Fryzite. Had it into game two, just a Lawali a little bit more. Because uh, yeah. it did have the HP advantage going into uh, the Vola v Vola fight. Oh, uh, plus we need you to restream game two in the Discord. We can see it on stream, but not on not on the disco. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Game number two, AAL qualifier. Or no, AAL uh, day two, baby. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. All right, so the first band comes through on the Vola on Snoopy's side now instead, which means he could lead with that hard aggro if he so chooses. And with the Koish first pick, it definitely appears that way. Oshiara, though, very nice counter for that. It's going to do some good uh, neutral damage with really high special attack prowess. Probably enough to uh, decommission Mimit with a little bit of help from a Volfi or even a Lawali at this point. If it can outspeed, we saw it outsped the Mimit in game one. So that's potentially a speedy Lawali. 
Yeah, a very fast Lolly or, or slower Mimit as well. Uh, a max speed plus one aerobic Volarend should outspeed a Lolly, so it, it likely is a not not maximum speed on Mimit, but or again, like you said, the, the Lolly is just absolutely crazy fast. Volfi picked out here, so I think we're going to see the double Wacka Smacka special. Um, let's see if Snoopy does pick it up here. I th yeah, a lot of it will come down to speed for Snoopy if he wanted to go that route. Uh, counter enough with his own Volfi, that still feels risky as we saw Fryzite's Volfi was faster in game one, which means Aquatic Whirlwind plus Plague is going to demolish Snoopy's side. It also means that the Kush is kind of just double outsped here now, right? Like. It doesn't have any synergy uh, to turn on Lava Wave, so uh, Snoopy will have to switch to get the Koishin ahead of either of Fryzite's temps. Kind of an interesting lead here. Um, normally you would see, I think prior to the latest patch, Fire Koish being a, a pretty safe opener on blue, but now we do see that it, it sort of doesn't have as many options now, and losing that Quetzalenyo, definitely a problem. Yeah, it's. I think that a lot of it is the Volfi presence. So when you force those fire quishes in with another water tem instead of a potential scunch or move flank, it really emboldens Volfi. Uh, you know, there's no more risk of P jab Oshidashi or just straight off the bat goring and base jump pure damage onto those weak defenses. It, it makes things a lot easier for Volfi to counter the quishes. And that's kind of why it's fallen out, I think. It, it's always... The, the power of the Koish was always in its turn one, two, three. You know, it doesn't have the HP or stamina to survive much beyond that, but when you give it the Synergy Master damage and the priority, it, it was pretty strong in the past. Yeah. I think right now this lead is looking really good for Fryzite. Uh, the Giaus uh, yeah. picked up third makes me wonder if that's going to be the swap in for Koish, just try to get the mirroring damage off on both sides. But that would be sacrificing Gialis, I think. Yeah, one thing you're really excited about when you're playing against aggro players, so in this case, Fryzite playing against the aggro player and Holy Snoopy, they have uh, good swaps on turn one. So Snoopy kind of has to play a guessing game here. Nidrasil will take uh, Plague very well. Um, if it comes in for one of the two temps, and it likely won't die to a, a unsynergized lava wave with no synergy master bonus. So no matter which slot Snoopy picks to double into turn one, um, it's very likely that Fryzite can provide a safe swap into it. So they are going to have to choose their turn one very carefully. So here we go. Game number two of day week two, day one of the Airborne Archipelago League qualifiers. And Fryzite brought the Lawali through in the end. I was getting worried for a moment, but the beautiful butterfly is still here. Still going to, unfortunately, suffocate some of the Thames on Snoopy's side. Hypoxy is a little bit scary sometimes. But uh, yeah, the initial lead, we, we talked about it a little bit. I do like the speed advantage on Fryzite's side. I love this Oshiara into the initial uh, lineup. I think as much as you don't want to take a Plague, why not just double that spot? We saw how much damage it, this Wolfie takes. I, I I think that it would go down in turn two. It wouldn't be a turn one kill. Oh, Snoopy does go for the swap. This is Gay Alice. This is a anticipating dealing a lot of damage potentially with a mirroring passive here. Which way will the horse shoot? It's onto the Gay Alice. So mirroring again, just delivering a free. 27% Plague, not enough to KO. And both people counter with its own Plague, and there you go, OCR taken down. It will snare away the handcuffs from Holy Snoopy side, but a smart turn one swap. Uno reverse cards the momentum, and now Snoopy's in the driver's seat. You know, it was a sacrificial horse, but maybe it was a decent play. I think the snare on the Volfi is very nice. Oshiara isn't absolutely necessary for this Koish on Snoopy's side. Uh, you know, Nidrasil is here. It can potentially do just as much damage as it takes, but because it's a little bit bulkier, it might survive longer. I I wonder if it was worth it. I think, you know, you you deal the damage to Kielis, you waste a little bit of its mirroring prowess because Oshiara was going to take a big hit no matter what. 
And you, you got Kialis down to a point where it's within death's range from anything. Yeah, something that the players are going to track probably a little better than we did is the exact percentage that Plague did here. Uh, Holy Snoopy has to know whether or not Plague is going to finish off Gaelis or not. Because if it is, they can't leave Gaelis in here. It's too valuable to be able to check the Volfi later on in the game, as well as deal good solid damage to Nindrasil uh, and not take Poison Ticks thanks to Chamomile. I wonder if they try to mimic it, try to copy it, make a play that way, but... Uh, if Gaelis does live and it outspeeds the Volfi, then it can pick up a very valuable second kill here. So a lot hinges on the calculations and the bulk and speed of this Gaelis. I do like the thought of that Mimit play. Turn it into a Gaelis, you've got yourself Hook Kick and Crystal Bite available next turn. The chances of a DV headed in towards Volfi are pretty slim. Uh, the Sharp Stabs instead, though, just trying to hurt Volfi a little bit. Uh, you know, outspeeding the plague as you're able to sacrificing Gialis down to the grave. Mirroring damage brings Volfi below 50%, doubling up with the plague. It's not quite enough to kill, but it does have Volfi very, very low, very afraid for its life, afraid for its well being. And a Toxic Ink onto Volfi. That did quite a bit of damage as well. Fryzite's Nidra still has some attack in there. Yeah, for sure. And now we see uh, the benefits of OCR taking that plague attack. The snare means that this Volfi's not trapped. It doesn't have to stay in. It can come in later to check OCR's area of effect attacks once the aquatic whirlwind is dealt with. No handcuffs to keep the Volfi in place here. Yeah, and that's really where the value is going to come from, I think, for this Volfi towards the end game for Fryazide is just that team elusive trait. It's already so low on HP that if it stays in and goes for any attacks, it's going to be targeted single target and be taken down as well. But it can always swap in, avoid, you know, a Wrath, avoid a Tsunami, potentially even Sandstorm if that's the way that Wolfie goes on Snoopy's side. So Fryzite is retreating his Wolfie, saving it, letting Lowali take the heap of this damage instead. That's not going to be too, too much. Aquatic Whirlwind onto either of these spots is going to be pretty heavily resisted. Uh, you know, a little less than 30%, doubled up with a plague. We're, we're looking at half damage on Lowali, but it's still above 50%, which means Lowali doesn't have to go anywhere. You see the Tukma Mask giving OCR a little bit of health uh, against the Toxic Ink, and, and pretty good there, but it, it still can't take another hit from either of these Thames. And with the Koich kind of out of position here, not quite able to bring a fire attack this turn into either Nidrasil or Lowali, Fryzite's getting full value for those natures despite the first pick fire on Holy Snoopy's side. I wonder if maybe the late game play for Holy Snoopy here might actually be what we predicted the early game play would be, saving the Koish and the Mimit to kind of follow up as a late game huge threat now that Osiara is knocked out. Could double fire Koish simply carry the day? We'll have to see. It could absolutely get something going. Oshiara is already gone. Volfi is very, very injured. And I think those double Synergy Master Lava Waves, it would absolutely be enough for Gialis. It would take Lowali down from this point. And probably enough for Nidrasil after this Wrath as well. It's going to be hard resisted, but it is still about 7% damage and every little bit counts towards the end. Allergic Spread, though, is so much back under this Oshiara, taking advantage of Botanist in a way that not a lot of players do. Dust Vortex back on that Nidrasil, heavily resisted, not going to do too much damage. And the Toxic Ink means that it is a board wipe. I wonder if Snoopy really wanted the wipe, because now they come in, they don't have to wait, they don't have to swap to get either of these fish in. And now it's a feeding frenzy of the fish versus the three Nature Thames and the Crystal. Uh, only Volfi taking neutral damage, and Volfi without the HP to really resist. Without the OCR, does Fryzite just get run over by some armed, literally armed fish? I think it depends on how the Mimit is built. We've seen it take the appearance of both physical and special attackers now. So we need to see how much damage it'll do, but holy cow, Koish, you just killed Nidrasil on your own, buddy. That means Lava Wave on Lawali does the same. And stamina is not going to be a problem anymore. I thought Nidrasil was going to take a little bit more to kill than that. But now Volfi and Gialis with a lot to do and probably not enough to make it happen. 
Look away, non-aggro fans. Look away. You don't you, no, you don't like what you're about to see. Uh, these two fish are, are going, and there's nothing that can stop them. Is another double lava wave. The first one smashes through the Gialis, and the last one it is a bush. <laughs> Both people live for one turn. Can we talk about, too, the real Koish is faster than the Volfi is. I understand, you know, Volfi is a very slow tem on its own, but people have been running it a little bit faster here lately, especially we saw Fryzites was faster than Snoopy's, so just now turn the tables there a little bit and it's good see. to see it come back. It was a little bit too scary for so many natures, so many, uh, in, well, only one crystal, but not much to stand in the way. Uh, so getting rid of that all all of it none of that mimic shenanigan just just no more koish is is a good advantage for fries getting rid of the vola is tough as that is what got him through game one was all of those buffs but i definitely think that the the thames that he has here it's a it's enough to get the job done especially considering snoopy has two water thames so it's a little bit easier for uh, you know the likes of Nidrasil or Lawali to have more of an impact compared to some of these other teams that we're seeing now that are so heavily toxic or even fire based. Boys, well, you'd be hovering that aerobic Volarin again, considering it perhaps. Uh, the thing with Mimit is you can often engineer these double mi these double tem leads, but uh, given Fryzite's sort of diversity in their team building process, they've managed to make it so that it doesn't really behoove uh, Snoopy in any way to double up on a Tem here. So we will see Vola. This is the Aerobic Vola picked up alongside the Gialis. And that seems like a very solid pickup of the Tolkien. That Tolkien looks very well positioned here. Yeah, absolutely. And we kind of see it again. It's that fire and nature lead, which means Snoopy can't just swap in Oshiara or uh, Tukai to try and take the fire damage because then there's a plague coming through so it would really he'd be forced to swap into either the mimit or the volfi and that's a lot of damage to take with two tems that are supposed to have a lot of aggressive power and and deal a lot of the damage for his team so maybe that's not a very safe swap maybe it is better for him to just take the mirroring damage like we saw in the past and and just do a little bit to tolkien yeah, I, I think this is shaping up to be a very similar game to game number one, where you see all of these Thames being picked up. And now that we know that the Vola is aerobic instead of anaerobic, it's looking like a very strong game for the Wally. Be very surprised if Fryzite doesn't pick it. And there it is, picked up last alongside the Nidrasil. So really, if if Gialis can be lowered, uh, if always Snoopy's Gialis can be brought down or dropped to low HP, you're looking at a situation once again where almost all of the Thames, notwithstanding, uh, have a very hard time contending with the, the, the sheer uh, offensive force from uh, Air, Air, Hands Fan Hypoxia. I believe it's Hand Fan. Oh no, it's Botanist. It's, so it's not. Yeah, no, no. But I think it's Hand Fan. Yeah. Am I going crazy? Anyways, game it, number. It three. is. Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. is the Hand Fan. So it's almost making up for that shortcoming. It's like when uh, people use a Hand Fan neutrality Barnshi. They want to make up for the lack of air specialist with the gear instead. And it's really strong with something like a Lawali. It's kind of like giving you the best of both worlds. Your hypoxia is hit hard, and you still have uh, you still have the resin traps going forward all the way as well. So I, I love Lawali into this matchup. It's kind of like you mentioned. The only real damage dealers would be the Nox Bomb from Vola or a Crystal Bite from Gialis. And Gialis isn't very happy right now, and Volaren takes just as much damage once it's minus one, minus two special defense. So early on, it looks like Fryzite has a very good pick ban, a fantastic team headed into the third game. He's just going to maneuver himself properly because the Volaren could still have an impact on some of these other temps like the Nidrasil, like the Gialis even, uh, that, you know, might be focusing on other targets. Yeah, I mean, I look at these two drafts and I would think if that's an anaerobic Volaren on Holy Snoopy's side, I think they have a draft advantage, but definitely have to favor uh, Fryzite here with the aerobic instead um, on Snoopy's Volarent. But, I mean, they know this team very well. They're likely positioning themselves for their own sort of win conditions around it. So we'll see what they decide to do. I know aerobic Volarent does very strongly threaten Volfi and Nidrasil with the extra speed. So we'll see what the... Um, and also Lowali can get hit by Noxious Bomb if it's not careful, but we'll see what goes on here. 
Yeah, a lot of it. A lot of it's down to Snoopy's turn one. What does this Gialis want to do? If if Gialis is saved, then who is being sacrificed? Because really, Volvi's the only one that's going to take neutral damage on both sides. But that's still probably fifty percent. Gialis does retreat. He doesn't want to throw it away just yet. The Mimit to turn into double Vola. That, that is pretty scary if he's able to get himself set up. It means that uh, the real Volar End is a little bit safer to play its game, get itself speedy. But this this double in on Mimin, it's still a lot of damage. It's still 50% even. And that that might mean that Mimit's just dead now. It's trapped in place. It can't do anything. Another Fiery Soul Plague will kill Mimit. For sure. And... We are looking at this hyperkinetic strike, building up a little bit of damage now from the Volarend. Feather Gatling giving it that arrow bonus, so something to watch out for. But man, that move sucks. Uh, it's probably not going to be able to deal enough damage to bring down this Volfi. And like you said, it's very, very clean gameplay here, right? 50% from Mimit takes from F Soul and Plague. And as we've seen before, the Mimit is not as fast as the Volfi, because Bush was able to go before Lava Wave. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think this, this Mimit just bites the dust. Well, perhaps that's not the case. We'll have to see what the Tamers decide. Well, it wouldn't even be a bad thing for Fryzide, right? Because you get rid of the Mimit, there's no more risk of, you know, doubling up on any of these other Thames that might stand a chance. And this Volarend is just making itself weaker to all of your special attackers right now. I mean, sure, now it is plus two speed, but it's almost out of stamina. It's just used as HKS, so if it leaves and comes back, it won't have that available. And it's minus two special defense. I mean, the double in on Mimit, it, it was a little bit too easy to make that call. And that's a really good position now. This Volarend is not very safe, and nobody else wants to fight a full HP Tolkien. Yeah, I, I mean... Like we said, the aerobic Volaren is a bit of a head scratcher here. This is a pretty good board state for Snoopy, though, right? Uh, OCR does have the hurry wart. It can pressure either of these Thames of the Aquatic Whirlwind. So, Fryzite is kind of on the back foot. Uh, kind of looking like they might be forced to swap out here. But, um, oh, we, we're off stream. We're back on stream. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Gaialis, though, does have the mirroring that uh, you kind of have to watch out for uh, on both sides. And I wonder if Tolkien tries to just throw a tornado into either slot, it could deal a lot of damage. I wonder for Fryzite here, if this is just a double swap and then swap again next turn, uh, you could, you know, safely bring out Nidrasil and Lawali so that wherever Oshiara targets, it's not going to do very much damage. And then probably swap out Nidrasil so that it doesn't eat a plus two HKS. <laughs> Maybe make that a Gialis instead and just send all of that mirroring damage back towards Volarend. And Lawali is perfectly happy fighting Oshiara. It's it's got the resin trap. <laughs> that could be a play for Fryzide. It would put him in a uh, a weird position for this turn, but a, a pretty solid board state the turns afterward. Yeah, Snoopy's in such a weird spot because you don't really want to attack on the Volaren because you overexert yourself. You don't really want to leave because nothing's taking the moves that you would be taking if you leave very well because Oshiara is already in play. And then you, so. It's pretty good to rest, right? Especially if you've got Matcha or Sweatband. But you can't rest because you're minus two special defense. Nidrasil does come in. Will it be a double? No, no double. So they do just decide to attack. They're going to deal pretty good damage to Nid, but that's an overexertion. It's a slight OX. The Fiery Soul towards Volaren does most of its HP. But now it's stayed on the field. Is Oshiara feeling it? No, the Blizzard on Tolkien wanted to double up just in case and make sure you do damage to Nidrasil. But that means Tolkien has just survived a turn on the field with Oshiara. Gialis is trembling in the background right now. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I mean, that just kind of seemed like a Hail Mary there from Holy Snoopy, right? Like trying to catch the Nidrasil coming in for the Tolkien, but... Uh, no, it looks like Fryzite made the correct swap there, and now they're very well positioned. Gaialis can come in here for Tolkien, so it doesn't have to overexert, and Volarend unable to punish either slot because of that overexertion we mentioned earlier. So, Holy Snoopy uh, went for a coverage play, you know, win damage on both sides, but the aerobic buffs really putting Volarend at risk here. 
it's it's a really spicy tech. I used to love the aerobic volas towards the end of Kesua. It was in such a good place. But these nerfs to the speed tiers and the nerf to HKS and the nerf to the aerobic trait has really put it in a difficult situation. I He's definitely still gotten value out of this bird. It's done quite a bit to Nidrasil. It's almost taken Wolfie down. But it's minus three and overexerted in 12% HP. So it's it's not looking too good right now. I think that you kind of mentioned it. The Gialis comes in for Tolkien. Just make sure that Oshiara goes down. And then Tolkien kind of wins it, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the way that speed changes have been done and the way that aerobics been done dirty and mostly just the way that speed changes and HKS have been changed, you know, I think somewhere in the world, RGI Isosceles just started crying. Uh, as here comes Servatio's Wrath into Gaialis, the mirroring's going to reflect that damage. So, there you go. It does take that damage. And Toxic Ink the other way. So, actually moderate damage. And we do see OCR still pretty hale and hardy heading into the next turn. Yeah, I think that that's probably fine, right? Because uh, now Wolfie definitely doesn't outspeed with its DV. Potentially a double in if plague is enough to outspeed a, a plague and aquatic whirlwind that would overexert Oshiara though, but that might be enough to bring Gialis down. And you, you take that so much damage back from mirroring, and then the toxic ink follow up from the Nidrasil will surely be enough to secure a kill. And then Tolkien is kind of free from that point on, right? So it's it's a very difficult situation for Snoopy. They've got to make. It, they've got to call exactly what Fryzite's going to do for this and maybe even another turn after and counteract it accordingly, or we could have a very difficult situation here. Aquatic Whirlwind does come out. This is an overexertion. Yeah. Into Gialis. There's a the Go ahead. Gialis falls down 54%, down to 34, a full 20 from mirroring the plague. It definitely outspeeds the Nid, but it's hard to resist it. Trapping it in place, potentially nice, though, is now Voloren can come back out and get some pretty free damage. Yeah, Hyperkinetic Strike is available, because we did, it did use Feather Gatling before it swapped out. So we do see uh, HKS as an option, but now with OCR no longer available, Tolkien sort of looms large in the back here for Fryzite. Uh, and then with the plus three special defense, Sorry, the minus three special defense on the Volarend. I'm thinking of anaerobic again. Uh, Loali, again, just even with the Gaius in front, it may just be enough to KO the other Thames and sort of get Fryzite over the line here. But it will be Volfi that comes in instead. Yeah, Volfi versus Vola. Nitrosil is not very happy, but at the very least, Fryzite's Volfi does outspeed Snoopy's Volfi. So it could confirm the kill on Volarend if that's something that Fryzite's worried about, but I think due to all the priority in the back on Tolkien, it's probably better off just targeting this Volfi. It's not going to kill from 46%, but definitely going to do more than half of what's left and put it in that range where anything on Fryzite's side would be enough to kill Volfi, and it would be all up to this Gialis. It definitely is a strong Tem. It's got fantastic attack potential, but the way that so many teams are building Gialis right now, focusing so much more on HP and mirroring damage instead of speed and attack, means that it's very unlikely that it's going to sweep against, you know, potentially three to four tens. And, and even if it is speed, then that means it doesn't have the longevity, right, to be able to take down multiple tems, because you can only hit one tem at a time with Gialis, uh, you know, until Arbory, knock on wood. Uh, but we'll see what uh, the Tamers decide to do here. As you, like you said, that Volfi's got a lot of good targets, actually. Almost anything that gets hit by a Plague here is not happy about it. Yeah, it's really... It's up to Snoopy if... If he wants to swap Gialis in for Volfi. I don't know if that would be worthy of the damage. The HKS absolutely comes through and absolutely dispatches the snake no more nidrasil that does mean wolf is a little bit happier but i don't know this plague from fryzite it's down to 13 percent and just like that all of the smiles are gone on that poor poor wolfie 
it's almost overexerted. It, it gets its retribution. It kills the Volfi on the opposing side. But now he's so, so low. Volar and overexerted, which means Tolkien is free to fire his soul that spot. Even if Gialis comes in, that is just so much damage. And Lawali is pretty much guaranteed to kill whatever he attacks this turn. If it's the Gialis that swaps in, then the double in will kill. And if Volarin stays, then that's a dead bird. Did that Vola just OX from half stamina? That's HKS is crazy. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Why, I think it why takes it like this. <laughs> it takes quite a lot of a TV investment just to reach like 55, 57 stamina on Volar End. Unbelievable. So, and a lot of people don't want to give it the uh the sweatband anymore just because it is a little bit more a little bit more difficult to run. So uh yeah, it definitely costs a lot of stamina when it wants to go for those HKSs. And now it comes back in. And it still doesn't have that stamina back. It was only one turn. It could feather Gatling. It could Nox Bomb Loali. It would probably go first at plus four speed. But that's still a probably because of how speedy this Tolkien potentially is. The Nox Bomb uh, doesn't KO the Loali. It uh, almost KOs the Bowler End, though. And Fiery Soul will clean up Gaialis. So now a little bit of mirroring damage back into Gaialis. And uh, now this bowler end gets to sit and think about what it's done for a few moments until it gets hit by hypoxia, and then boom, down it goes. So, victory in game number three for Fryzite, and the series comes to a close. Yeah, that was an incredible play. In Speaking the of the aggro core, it's Turby with the aggro core, aggro team. I don't know if Prody cares as much, though. <laughs> Some of these Thames are a little bit more on the bulky side, and due to common factor not taking the initial ban, because Nag is a little bit too uh, detrimental to these aggro cores, it means that he can play his own game. If he wants to use that Adoro 2 or he can. He brought Lowaddle for the fun as well, so potentially some Lowaddle Faraday cages with the Synergy Master. That's... I think Luwaddle's got some pretty decent attack stats, right? So those will do quite a lot of damage. The biggest problem with Luwaddle tends to be that it's easy to outspeed, particularly by these aggro teams. If I'm a betting man, which I'm not, I would bet that Prody's opener here is going to be Gaialis Mimit. Um, to double up on the mirroring, and Turby trying to counteract that by leading the Barnsey. Nope. But here, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, it's not too much initial turn one pressure, but that is incredible turn two. And that means that none of these special attackers even want to attack. So maybe it's best for Turbo to just bring a Volar in and hit Feather Gatling just to avoid hurting himself. Yeah, this is uh, we just finished doing Dreamhack earlier today, and this was a pretty common opener from Prody who ended up uh, winning the tournament um, into these special attacking teams. He likes to open double mirroring on the Gaialis, and even against teams that are running Barnsey, the double, the double double gash, quadruple gash, if you will, onto the uh, Osiara combined with the effects of mirroring is often enough to bring the Osiara down on turn one. And that's kind of what Prody is more or less looking for here. As we see in the second phase bands, another bird taken out by Prody. He doesn't like birds with that toxic backline. And on Derby side, getting rid of the Nidrasil, so. The natures are a little bit freer to do their thing. If that comes true, if Oshiara goes down to a quadruple gash, that's pretty scary damage from Brody's side. That's a lot more than I would have expected Gialis is to accomplish on turn one. I know Oshiara is a little bit squishy, but that's still a lot. <laughs> wow. That means uh, even this barn, she's probably going to take, you know, 20, 30% from Mirin, isn't it? Well, the big, yeah, the biggest damage dealer in that equation is Osiara dealing damage to itself. Uh, is mirroring, just reflecting the aquatic whirlwind back, and then the du two double gashes are typically enough to finish it off. But not all Osiaras are built the same, so let's see if Turby's got a better built one for game number one of this series. Gialis, Gialis, Barnshi. And Vossi, Vossi, we're not supposed to see you until later this evening. What are you doing on the field, you silly horse? 
if, if it's Vossi, then this is probably like some weird hydrologist ice shirk in Oceara. So the entire lead is, is, uh, is different. So we don't have to worry too much about it. Yeah, we're saved. If that's what we see right now, hydrologist physical Oceara, I, I will question it, but I will, I will understand at the end of the day and I will respect it. <laughs> it would be fantastic into this. It's the perfect counter for double mirroring. I think it's a bold claim that either one of us would understand it by, by the end of the day. I think if we saw Hydrolytus here, it would be uh, unprecedented, uh, completely <laughs> unprecedented. Um, I, I hope we, we don't see it, but we'll see. What do you, I think Oshiar has got like one physical attack. You just throw it on a PJAB team and there you go. <laughs> Guaranteed. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, physical freeze, baby. Let's go. Let's get it. Uh, what is this Barnshee going to do is an interesting question, too, right? I assume it stays and tries to pressure. So there's the double gash. Oh, wow. Yeah, Turbi goes for Tsunami. Is Turbi aware of how mirroring works? Say it ain't so. Look at that damage. <laughs> oh, no, but it's the horse is built enough so that it will resist. There's the double gash. The bossy, yep. Yeah. So they do manage to retain Aquatic Whirlwind, but so this is the, the cool part about how uh, mirroring works, right? Is that now, if you Aquatic Whirlwind one of these Gaialises, you're probably knocking yourself out as well. And that is a maximum speed Gaialis on Purdy's side. So Sharp Stabs is likely coming out, forcing some sort of swap play here. And let's be honest, losing Oshiara right now when Turok is still in the back doesn't feel great. You know, that means that potentially Mix is going to have to find itself on the field with some Thames it doesn't want to fight, along with, you know, Mudrid a, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Mudrid still takes effective damage due to its crystal typing from a rock fall or a stone ball, and it's not doing effective damage back in any way, shape, or form to that Turok. So uh, maybe Vossi is still a little bit too important, and maybe Turbi doesn't want to lose the horse right away. But that means that somebody needs to be comfortable swapping into potentially double up crystal bites hook kicks or a crystal bite and a hook kick which means everyone in the back dies yeah I, although to be fair if if Turby wants they can just wait for common factor to come out and then they ignore all that type chart stuff and, and just, just kill him also a, also a factor a common factor if you will but here we go Barnsley retreats fearing the sharp stabs coming out from the gay houses the mix comes in now what happened? Prody went for the stabs, so this is not quite Puppet Master. And there's Aquatic Whirlwind. He's going to target the Gaius, so... No, he targets the Mimit. Okay, well, that that's it for that, Osiara. And the other Mimit goes for Hook Kick. And there goes the Mix. Ooh. Is that GG? <laughs> that might be the end of Game 1 already, because these Gaius... They're... They're still here. They can still fight anyone who wants to come in. I mean, Mudrid dies to a quadruple gash. <laughs> uh, Wolfie well, would still probably take 50%. And you'll note, one of them still has hook kick, and the other one still has sharp stabs, right? So you can't, like, Barnchi can't come in, right? Like, you're going to get stabs. And then Mudrid can't come in. It's going to get hook kicked, right? Same with Wolfie. So let's see what the play is here. Uh... Perhaps some sort of crystal dust to try and bring down one of the Gaiuses, or maybe trying to outspeed with soil steam. But the Mimit is maximum speed. Yeah, that might be asking too much. I think it, potentially Barn she doesn't go down though, because if Mimit, I don't, I don't remember which one clicked which attack previously. Is it Mimit that still has sharp stabs available? I believe it is the blue Mimit that still has sharp stabs and the okay. red Mimit that has hook kick. But I might I might have that backwards, actually. <laughs> if if it is that way, if it is the Mimit with sharp stabs, we saw it do less damage uh, against the Oshiara with its first double gash. So it, it isn't max attack like the real Gialis potentially is. That might not be enough sharp stabs to bring down Barnji, but I wouldn't want to risk potentially not killing the Mudrid either, because that gets pretty scary if you leave an Earth Tem on the field long enough. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, Prody is running the Mario Mimit, which is uh, max HP, max speed, so you always use all of the TVs, no matter what you 
duplicate. Like if you take a physical attacker, you still have your HP and speed TVs. And if you take a special attacker, you still have your HP and speed TVs. It's the most like well-rounded way to play Mimic. Uh, and that's because he needs to use it for uh, the Waddle Cheese, as well as this cool double Gialis opener. And then it's also just a great time to force yourself into stronger board states, because if you copy something and you have Doppelganger Brooch, you don't need to invest offensively because you just deal that damage through the Doppel Brooch. So really, really strong Tem. One of the reasons that Mimit is considered top tier by many players. Yeah, the Doppel Mimit is a little bit too much for so many teams, but Brody bringing Turok in instead. Oh no, this bird doesn't care at all what uh what happens on the other side of the field the tornado is enough to bring mimit down but mirroring is doing quite a lot to barnshi as well soil steam just so heavily resisted even with the terrible special defense that Turok has it only took 21 percent that was very bulky in the grand scheme of things and now the real gialis is still alive the two iron adoro cheese is still possible this is pretty scary for Turby right now. On the other side, uh, Turby does have an option into Prody now because Crystal Deluge is up and available. So they do have the option to start putting threats to sleep and focusing on the other side. Uh, Adora Boros is kind of an interesting thing here too because it uh, does have access to that melee damage. Uh, Gialis maybe not wanting to take the damage uh, from Barnchi, which can kind of crank more into it despite the, the mirroring. But Barnji, a little bit low on stamina, maybe not having enough stamina to get the job done. We'll have to see sort of what the decisions that Prody and Turby go for here and sort of how they play out over these next two turns are probably the most important turns of the match. Yeah, it's it's up to Turby to find a way through, I think, because Prody, Prody can just ignore the Barnji right now. Uh, Adora Boros potentially risky tornado is gone so the most effective damage that would hit this spot is either the crystal deluge or wind burst and a crystal deluge onto this wouldn't make as much sense just because you know can't put a mental time to sleep i would have i would have liked to see Prody bring gialis in i think instead of adora boros because then you kind of make turby choose if he wants to play the aggro play He's either, you know, putting one or the other to sleep. He's probably not going to be able to kill Gialis and put Turok to sleep. Uh, so you're kind of guaranteed either damage on Wolfie or a kill on Mudred that turn. Wire does come in, so we will see common factor in play here. Crystal Deluge onto two iron, knocking off that nullification, putting it to sleep and dealing quite a bit of damage. Hypoxia, though, instead of the Wind Burst, it would have been pretty scary, but Adora Boros holds on a little bit. Aloe Vera, though, still does kick in, still does deal more damage, and the Beta Burst is enough to bring Barnshi down. Final two Thames for Turby, and still a mountain to climb. It's uh, crazy to think about that that Barnshi, uh, that Beta Burst that it took, what it's, was its first attack that it received, and it was at 23% HP from two cases of mirroring and then uh, exhaust or overexertion. It uh, it was at like under th almost 30% HP without ever having received an attack. And then Prody just polishes it off with beta burst. Yeah, that's that's incredible value from the Gialis Mimit lead beyond the damage that they did actually do to the likes of Mix and Oshiara you killed a Barnshi for free. I mean, that's that's the kind of value that was just unheard of in previous metas. And and we had mirroring before. There was a slight time where we had a mirroring bomb of level one Thames that would just obliterate the enemy. So it's it's more balanced, but it's still so strong on these Gialis. That's just it's terrifying when you see that mimic Gialis lead. Yeah, that recent the recent buff, I think it was in Siponku that changed mirroring from I think 20% to 40% uh, really really made a big difference and it's really bringing Gialis into consideration as a special attack aggro counter that's something to think about. Escapist triggering here making it so that uh, Prodi's Adora Boros can leave if it wants no longer locked in by the cuffs um, this is a very threatening Volfi uh, however so 
Chirby running out of Thames and running out of HP, but definitely does have some interesting tight matchups to take advantage here, um, as long as T-Wire doesn't come in to ruin them again. I think that's what we see, right? T-Wire comes in for Adoroboros. Stoneball towards the Mudred is enough to kill for sure. And then Gialis is enough to fight Kitsune, right? Yeah, I would think for sure. Uh, it's just Torbi just has too many things that, that they need to hit and really not enough stamina and HP bar to, to continue to do so. Uh, they're going to have to... Prody's going to have to probably give Torbi a window somewhere here by going for some sort of weird swap play or weird not swap play. And then Torbi's going to have to seize that opportunity and go for it. This is kind of where you have to do something a little bit unpredictable maybe if you're Torbi because... Uh, if the game just plays out conventionally, I don't see any way that they win. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It was just a little bit too heavy of a lead early on, dispatching the Oshiara while Turok still had 100% HP. Well, Tuire as well. I mean, it, it does have common factor each time it comes in, so you'd think it's a little bit more resistant, but all it would take is trapping it in and then clicking a water move the following turn, and it would be enough. It would be destructive towards two wire so the oshiara does or would have had a lot of value if it was able to stay alive uh, but the mirroring damage was just a little bit too much early on it gave Prody such a strong advantage and now he's just he's not let up this entire time he's been keeping the pressure on he's been board wiping and and just so destructive yeah, this game is pretty much a, a calling card of uh, mirroring Gaialis, right? Like, this is just a un unbelievably uh, good showing from the Thames. Like, really kind of drives home that 40% damage dealing to yourself. Really tough for aggro. Common factor does come in, as you predicted here. And it just means that Turok will take neutral damage from the crystal, but it also means it takes neutral from the plague, and thus, here it is. Escape is stopping that. And then here comes the stone ball. Will it KO? Yes. I wonder if that would have done more damage as a uh, soil steam instead of a crystal dust. Probably not enough to kill the Turok, but it would have been close. Yeah, potentially. And that is it for game number one. Prody taking the win. And... You know, we're, we'd be looking at the Mudrid going for Crystal Deluge. We'd be looking at the Crystal Spikes, the Amphitheor. Really, the only slow damage would be Volarend, but we have to expect Prody's running a reactive Vile Naga anyway, so that Nox Bomb's doing less than half percent, or half percent, less than half damage. Uh, you know, Naga's going to then resist and get itself a little bit of a heal, and he's going to be good to go for the rest of his DA turns. Yeah, and, and this is why we stress constantly, you know? I mean, you've done this, I do this myself as well. When we talk to players, especially newer players, or we talk to players in, like, main competitive chat on the Discord, uh, you know, people always say stuff after new patches, like, you know, aggro's busted, aggro can't be stopped, aggro is too strong, and then look, it's taken, what, two and a half weeks, and Prody's already got almost a completely perfect answer to the current aggro being run. This game's always a dance of adjustment, and I think this is a really good set that kind of shows that and displays that. As we see now, Turby's going to have to overcome the Geiss, which is coming out for him. Uh, looks like in tandem with a Lowaddle, uh, perhaps. Maybe even in this game number two. That wouldn't be a terrible idea. I mean, you kind of mentioned it earlier. The Lowaddle's speed was always what held it back a little bit, uh, you know, especially against the high aggro. So put it into Seed Aura. Don't give it any speed TVs. And. You know, against most things, you'll be going first. Faraday Cage is terrifying damage, and it has even more beyond that. Uh, you know, especially if it is a Sapuku, it can just sacrifice onto an opponent on turn two with the shortest doom you've ever seen. Now, we didn't see this at any point during Dreamhack. No, here we go. It is going to be... This is Prody's common opener with Nagais into aggro teams. This is uh, Nagais' common factor, so they won't even be able to get that electric attack into the Naga because Deceit Aura, um, sorry, because Common Factor is going to uh, give them that neutralized status already. It does mean that Reactivile won't trigger until the neutral uh, neutrality runs off. Um, the, sorry, the neutralized status uh, runs out, but it does create an interesting situation for um, both players. Turby, it looks like they're going for the handcuffs on the Volfi to try and get rid of that neutralized status, but we'll have to see for sure. 
Yeah, that is... We saw that yesterday in the weekly. Uh, I think Talon did it in the finals. He, he, yeah, he did with a Noxolotl instead of a Volarend. But that was a very different situation. Uh, you know, yesterday Talon was able to do damage effectively to trigger the nullification. This time it is nullified at the start, which means you don't have that extra boost of 30-40% damage before turn two. Once you've knocked it off and can start to attack again, he's going to be in a much better place then. So it might not work out the same way for Turby. It might not be the cut and dry strat that we've seen so many times now. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting situation. Um, normally, the Volarend and um, normally Volarend and Volfi can be a somewhat safe lead for aggro into Nagais, depending on what the Nagais protector is. But I don't think many players are prepared for Nagais common factor. So we're gonna have to see what that ends up being. Um, we do see Prody hovering Mimit, thinking about Mimit versus Adora Boros here. A very common combination that Prody does run is. Adora Boros giving synergy to two wire, which means that the two wires Faraday cage can actually clear the neutralized status onto something. So if a Tem is in front of Adora Boros that is weak to Adoro, it can come in and give Faraday cage synergy and then be able to hit it super effectively. Here we go. Game number two. Let's see what it holds for us. It kind of works both ways with that Adoro as well, because the Emanip with handcuffs will also clear things off. So he could uh, get effective beta bursts, Ferulean Gusts, Faraday Cages, or Feather Gatlings. Yeah, the neutralized status just does it has such great synergy with Nagais's uh, Deceit Aura, because it makes it so that Nagais doesn't have to invest uh, SVs into, sorry, TVs, sorry into its um, speed. So it's able to build much bulkier than most Thames. And neutralizing it just sort of really takes advantage of an, its otherwise uh, fairly weak uh, type resistances. Yeah, absolutely. This, I mean, the initial field, it favors Prody in my opinion. I think that his Thames, if we're looking purely at a uh, powerful turn one attack and physical slash special attack stats, uh, Prodies are definitely higher, I think, on both of these Thames compared to the Volarend and the Volfi. So the early game, this is looking good. Nobody does swap the Beta Burst towards Volfi. Enough to bring it down to 58. The Feather Gatling following up is so much more. Straight down to 7% before it even attacks. Knocks Bomb towards Naga. It's a nice chunk of damage, but it's just not going to do it with the nullified status, the plague as well. It will uh, trap and un-nullify this Naga, but wait a second. Reactive Vile. It's re-nullified. That doesn't seem right, but it is. Uh, hang on a second. That's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, eight. knocked off. All right. Reactive exhaust vile. and then trap it knocks off and then it re oh my god that is incredible so it would appear that the first time in battle that the holder is attacked with an effective or super effective technique they receive the nullified condition for three turns and heal themselves so it looks like the game registered that naga was hit by an attack that should have been super effective or effective even though it wasn't and decided to give Naga the HP and the nullified status again anyways. That's, uh, didn't know that, um, but this completely scuffs Turby's plan as the Naga is still nullified. Like, what what is Turby gonna do here? Uh, the, they can't get the Naga below 55% with they use their two strongest attacks already, so Turby's gonna need a new plan and fast. Yeah, I guess the the way that it uh, procced on Naga, the way the calculator calculated, it knocked off both of the status and then it triggered? That's so strange, because typically, you know, if you attack a Tem that has Coat, then Coat appears beforehand. But I guess Reactive Vile does technically appear after the attack. Maybe it's just at a different calculating line, uh, you know, number six instead of number four. So it currently appears to be inconsistent because uh, we know from testing in PDX that um, 
pigment inverter and slingshot work. So if you hit something with pigment inverter and you deal 4x instead of uh, 1 fourth, you get slingshot. And then also, but if the tam is nullified, slingshot doesn't work. Uh, I think is the hmm. last thing that we found out. So like, it, it's a completely inconsistent interaction, but it is consistently seeming to be favoring Prody as Turby's having to pull a double out as an aggro player on turn two, and that is not something you're excited to see. Yeah, I mean, the swap, it's a potentially good. Mix does resist uh, the Psy Surge, and Amphiteer does resist the Feather Gatling, so not having nullified status on Turby's side of the board was helpful in that instance, and now Dewire definitely does not want to stay. Although Naga, he's still nullified. He's still good to go for a little bit. Yeah, and that means that there's still two more turns of Besidora as well. And with Naga, again, like you said, still nullified, it means that while T-Wire can get barbecued by Thunderstrike, Naga's still going to resist it pretty well. And this mix has to be very careful because Faraday Cage and Turbo Attack are both options that T-Wire has at its disposal, and the mix itself is not nullified. Uh, so one of those moves followed up by a Nagais's Fury could be uh, curtains for that mix. So both players having to maneuver carefully here. Yeah, I think it's all up to how Prody reads this. If if he's expecting Turby to double into this Naga spot to just try and brute force the problem, then two wire is pretty safe to stay and go for that attack. That would be a dead mix at the end of it. And even if no, I mean, Naga wouldn't go down then, because then he's only taking the attack from Funky How. So many other players in this game. <laughs> but that wouldn't be enough due to the nullification. So that that would be a very big read from Prody, but a very risky one as well, because keeping 2 Wire alive could be very valuable. Uh, you know, just getting those Feather Gatlings onto Volarend, getting effective damage onto Barnshee and Mix in the future could be pretty important. One of the things that 2Wire does particularly well is it uh, makes use of Toxic Thames with the synergy on Faraday Cage. So let's see. It is going to be the Volfi coming in. So Prody, or uh, Turby may be going for some sort of sacrifice play here. As it will take the Beta Burst. 2Wire yeah, goes with the Faraday Cage. Oh. And town goes mixed. That was that was scary. That was a lot of damage. That was more than I expected to see out of Two Wire. I, it is physical, and that is Mix's weaker point. But that was still so much HP left, and I, I would have expected Puppet Master personally. But that that was a lot. That was scary. Yeah, I mean this this game is uh, one more turn left on to see Aura. This is literally back to the drawing board. Aggro is is this game because. As we saw in game number one, Turby's lead was completely ineffectual against Double Mirror and Gaelis. And now he's trying to play into a Deceit or a Naga with a team that likely has somewhere between, you know, 1200 to 1500 TVs invested in speed. And those TVs are just actively losing Turby the game right now because of how powerful Deceit Aura is. And this is a thing that we've known for a while. But, I uh, roof, woof, it really does look rough here. Uh, having to see it even at only four turns, so. Uh, this is a definitely a very difficult situation for Turby. They're going to have quite the uphill battle here as a Mimic could even come in to renew the free trial of Deceit Aura after the Nagais has uh, passed away or, or lost the benefit. So we'll see if they decide to do that. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I think these aggro teams need to figure out how to fight Kialis because they are not making progress against Naga. I mean, in this match alone, there are four Thames that deal effective damage against Naga, and they just have been ineffective this entire time. So it, it's a little bit too powerful. And now one more Scyther is just taking advantage of the last remnants of its trait, doing so much damage on the Funky How. Faraday Cage towards Zephy as well. So just staying in on both spots, kind of challenging this Amphitir saying, you know, you can kill either spot, but you can't kill both, so I'll make a little bit of progress while I wait. And that's not the end of the world. I mean, with Mix gone, Barnshee, Barnshee might be the only saving grace for Turby now. Yeah, because you know what Prody has uh, up their sleeve here. I don't know if the, was the Nagais wasn't exhausted, so... 
what's stopping Prody from just bringing Mimit into the Nagai slot here? And starting Desidora up all over again. Oh no, don't you do that to Turby. Don't you put that on him. That would be so terrifying to just bring that back, followed up with a Turok. Oh no. Oh, it'll be Nidrasil. Turby is spared the uh, Deceit Aura Part 2 for now. We'll have to see oh, what the, uh, the options now. are. <laughs> oh, that would have been that would have been terrifying. The I guess the challenge would have been killing Amphitir before you take the damage. Um, but I guess yeah. it really wouldn't be because a double beta burst would under speed and would probably kill. Well, it is maximum speed mimic, so it, it probably isn't uh, super great for Prody. Also, they do have the option of bringing Mimit in on the left side now. Taking control of, uh, sorry, taking control, uh, copying a Amphitir would be pretty bad news for Turby, who has a Barnchi and a Volarind uh, left. Not Thames that want uh, Thunderstrike in their face. And so that is also an option. Basically, at some point, this Mimit is going to get pretty tremendous value, no matter how they decide to use it. So it'll be very interesting to see. Yeah, even if it were to turn into the Volarend, really, if, if things were to completely shift around on Turby's field, multiple swaps down the line, Mimit could become any of these Thames and still find itself some value. So that is just incredible to use that aggro Tem on a non-aggro team to be aggro and, and see it work flawlessly after this Naga, I just can't believe how much Deceit Aura accomplished. The timer's starting to run low for Turby, but I don't know. He's, he knows what he wants to do. He does retreat. Amphitir brings Barnshee in instead, as it's definitely the better way to fight this Nidrasil. Feather Gatling to start off Toxic Ink towards Barnshee. It is an air specialist, Barnshi, so it'll do more damage, but that means it does take the Toxic Ticks. And after the Beta Burst, Barnshee's all the way down to 6.5% before it's ever attacked. And there's some pretty free swap-ins here for Prody. Turok resists with wind. Mimit still has a lot of HP, and if it becomes a Naga, not only do we see what you had mentioned previously come to fruition, but it has that incredible special defense to eat a tornado. Yeah, this is um, looking pretty grim for Derby, I gotta say. Uh... You know, we're, we're supposed to root here, you know, I'm sure Turby can maybe think of something, but uh, I can't think of it. Uh, it looks pretty rough for them right now. Um, I think, again, Prody's going to have to give them an opening somehow with some sort of swap or, or some sort of interesting situation. But like you said, the time is ticking and it it I'm not sure if it's Prody or Turby who's running out of time because we... It, because of the spectator bug, but we'll see what happens. Looks like both players got their stuff in on time, and Nid leaves. It'll be Turok. Yeah, I don't think that you can expect anybody to make a mistake at this level. You know, you see Turby and Prody, and you don't think of players who who make oopsies. So uh, it's definitely going to have to be Turby grinding his way back in. Boosting the special defense of Volarend is a decent start, but with Turok here and all of that physical pressure and Mimit potentially swapping in and out a few times becoming a Tem that can do some effective damage. I mean, right now the choice is Amphitir, right? That's that's pretty easy. That's very effective. Yeah, it could also be Nidrasil, and then the play is to just um, turn into Mimit uh, Volarent at the end and then just get them with Feather Gatling, uh, Doppelganger Brooch, because this Vola can buff itself special defensively, but it can't buff itself defensively, and it has no answer really for uh, Feather Gatling uh, with Doppelganger Brooch. Either one is very bad news for, for Derby, right? Yeah, the writing is definitely on the walls. Derby with his final two Thames. Prody bringing the Mimit in to become an Amphitir just wants to take advantage of the high HP that he still has. It's I don't know. I want to believe that there's a way. Just because this funky how it could do a lot of damage to Turok right now with a plague. The, I guess the problem is Nidrasil is too easy of a swap and doubling in with Volarend on that same spot means that Amphitir as a Mimit is free to attack Volarend and just 
kind of end the game from there. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, oof. But Prody could probably double the Amphitheater with, like, Plague and Feather Gatling and still knock it out, right? So it's kind of a tough spot for Cerberi to be in. What do we got here? Oh, still waiting. Looks like Turby considering going deep into their reserve time. Yes, he absolutely should. If this is an accurate timer, if there is 35 seconds left, he's going to need all of that remaining just to figure out what to do. But it's only turn 7. If he can find a way to make turn 10, he's just going to have no time left and he's going to be a little bit panicked uh, trying to press buttons without, without fully thinking through his decisions. Yeah. Uh, if he makes it to turn 10, I will I will be surprised, I think, right? Like, it would be uh, also quite a feat, I would imagine, for Turby to live through three more turns here. Oh, I mean, the, the Molarend is pretty especially defensive. So, you know, maybe it maybe it sticks around. Uh, okay, so we do see Nidrasil coming in here. The Mimited Amphitheater does go for the Plague. Uh, not quite enough to KO. With the Doppelbruch. And there's Bright Beam. Clearing it of that exhaust status, but it did lose its stamina regardless. A Nox Bomb back towards Mimit does more than 50%, but I don't know. That's This is still pretty scary. It, it is forcing a double in on the real Amphitheer, which does put a little bit of pressure on this Nidrasil. If it, uh, if it gets doubled into itself, could potentially go down. But I don't know, 57% is a lot left on a pretty tanky snake. I guess the Protoby was reading some sort of plague onto the Turok, uh, which is why they kept, kind of kept it at the back. Uh, maybe going for this Turok to bring down Bullerend later on in the game. Um, but let's see here. Mimic goes for Bright Beam as well. Anything you can do, I can do better. Clearing the Bamboozle. Thunder yeah, Strike. That's, that's a great. <laughs> yeah, Thunder Strike. Not going to clear out the Nidrasil here. Does have Feather Gatling as an option? Will this KO? Ooh, not quite. Just barely hanging on, about 6%. Enough for the Toxic Ink to bring Amphitheer down. Relax healing HP on this Mimit. And now Volaren has to fight a Turok, and it's just not gonna happen. So a concession from Turby. And a pretty speedy 2-0 in the grand scheme of things for Prody. That Luma Raiken is gorgeous on Gunther's side. Yeah, now that you mention it, Dave Goblino is a pretty scary name, right? Like, it seems like it's like a member of, like, a gang of goblins that you would see around there somewhere, right? Like, this goblin's Kyle, this one's, you know, Ben, and this one's Dave. So this is Dave Goblino of the Goblin Gang coming in. Oh man, Dave is the scariest name too. He's the he's got the big leather jacket with like the very thick zipper on the front. <laughs> he's got three different pockets on his left side. That is scary potential right there. Yeah, yeah, and at least one band on his arm because all clothing in Temtem must have at least one armband. It has been decided. Uh, Tolkien band out first here, and Osiara on the other side. So here we go. Oh, we do see a Luma Riken, I believe, on Kundra's side. Yeah, that's Edward. He's just hanging out for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the early on, this is a good move, like lead. Actually, there's no mental uh, for turn one on the side of Dave. All that there's potentially could find is the narco hit from Noxolotl that is held behind a hold. So it's a little bit safe. There's a lot of special attackers, though, and that is where Mooflank does not like to get hit is in the special places. So uh, still still some pretty scary stuff. It, it's going to fight very hard, uh, but it's going to take some damage from this lead as well. This is uh, kind of an interesting team from Kundras because a lot of the times you see players like Dave, they are bringing, they do have, sorry, this special attack core, Tolkien, Volfi, Amphitheer, Osiara, right? And then they build around to build the counter to that matchup. So you see these Thames like Noxolotl and Volarend that are very specially defensive, not necessarily super physically so. And uh, I've, like this, this standard opener, this we got, you know, the, the classic Quetzalino, uh Goring Riken lead or like Quetzalino base jump lead here is does Dave actually have an answer for that? No longer running Nagais. 
Yeah, I mean, really, there is potential parry or Mashuk that could swap in, and he's not going to take too much damage. Tolkien is okay with the Quetzal, but doesn't really love the base jump. Other than that, it's just a lot of damage being dealt from that lead. That does mean that Wolfie is free to fight this Raiken, though, and that's something we saw a lot of in Kisua. The you know, potential for this Raiken to be built to survive a plague plus DV. Uh, but I don't know. That's that might not be what Kunders wants to build for and protect against right now. Potentially Wolfie is just gonna knock down the Luma before it's able to have the impact that it might want. Yeah, for sure. It, it does look like Kunders is a little uh, weak to um, the Toxics here. They're going to have a bit of trouble other than their Voldorant in dealing with those Toxic Thames, like that Parry or Mashuk. It does come in, but let's get on to it. It's uh, game number one of Kunders versus Dave Goblino. Yeah, so the really easy play would be a Cage in Quetzalino on Amphitheer. Uh, that's probably enough to take it down just because of the ridiculousness that is Raiken and get a free prideful buff early on would be very nice. It could also just be a base jump, just trying to do a little bit more damage. And yeah, no cage, Amphitheer retreats for Tolkien. So base jump, if this is targeting Volfi, that might be very scary. Zelenio coming out by that cool animation and it does drop onto the Volfi. Ah, but... Dave Goblino is no no aggro Volfi. This Volfi is chunky, and it is not going to be fussed at all about taking this double. Yeah, lives it pretty well, 40% still, and free to swap out if it likes. Yeah, a Quetzalenya on its own won't be enough to kill, but if you did notice, Quetzal outsped Plague. Which means if Volfi stays in and Mooflank is built faster with Goring, it is plus one speed right now, so it's unnoticed rather than Hurry Wart. That could still be a prideful buff kill onto Volfi at the expense of probably just a tornado towards Edward. Yeah, totally. I think uh, Dave Goblino is going to be playing uh, Hot Potato with its uh, Volfi with their Volfi slot here, trying not to let Riken get that prideful buff off um, and allow it to like snowball and smash through their team so i wonder what will be coming in here uh, obviously cage will not trap volfi so mashuk is a potential option to come in here um see what they go for volfi retreating for mashuk just wants the parrier to eat some of that physical pressure edward takes a tornado 86 percent down to 44. He ate that better than I expected him to. With a base jump onto Tolkien, expecting that swap. Quetzalenyo following up on Mashuk. And just not enough damage to make it happen. But this move flank now is plus two speed. Starting to reach that level where it's spiraling out of control a little bit. Yeah, and this is the great thing about move flank. Uh, it's got unnoticed to give it these speed buffs, and so you can build it a bit tankier, and obviously with resistance badge and a lot of attack power, base jump and goring, potentially even a double kick on this move flank can hit very, very hard and very, very fast. And like I mentioned before, this parry or mashuk is really Dave's only physically defensive tem, so they're going to have to be careful, or they're just going to get rampaged by the goat here. Yeah, it's definitely looking to be that way. A lot of these Thames, you know, other than the Mashuk, are not very physically bulky whatsoever. So a lot of damage potential. But it's I guess it's just as scary because both of these Thames, the Mooflink and the Raiken, need to be taken care of because they both just have so much power. The Raiken's Quetzalenos onto Volarend are still really strong neutral damage. And, and it's enough to destroy Amphitheer and what's left of Wolfie, just about. So, uh, I, I don't know, it's it's pretty terrifying. I think Dave has to target both spots at the same time, but also has to double both spots. Yeah, we see the third Quetzalenio coming out from the Raikin here. Again, mostly just doing chip damage now. I, I think Raikin is sort of taking a back seat to Mooflank as like the, I'm the carry now. Fire Tornado will come out. Mooflank, not a lot of great special defense, and it will drop low, but not low enough. Still kicking. Yeah, enough left that could potentially, 
you know, if it's uh, if Gunders is expecting Tolkien to retreat here and try to save its life, a double in on Mushuk would do more than half of what it's got left and put it in a position where probably a single feather gathering from Volaren would be enough to bring it out of its misery. Yeah, this is, is a bit of a call out from Kundras onto Dave here because I don't think Dave has um, tenderness up on their Mushuk because it seems like a tenderness would be almost a no brainer onto one of these Thames to cripple it. But we haven't seen that yet. Instead, opting for damage, so it's likely not to be the case. Edward's no longer trapped. It can leave and, and enable a different Tem here. The thing to watch is as Tolkien gets lower and as Volfi gets lower, Gaius looks a little bit better and better every time for taking out the Amphitheer and Volarend in the endgame. So Dave is uh, definitely going to have a tough time with those Thames and uh, Scaravolt as well. As Volfi gets lower, Scaravolt gets valuable, valuable, valuable. Out comes Edward. Yeah, Gielus coming in means that Mooflank is definitely targeting down that Tolkien spot, wants to get the kill with Goring, and does indeed protect Gielus for the future. The uppercut will finish off Mooflank, but this is still pretty good. Now Gielus has Crystal Bite, has Hook Kick available, so it's not a free Volfi. I mean, Volaren's the only one who doesn't take that effective damage, but that's such an easy Scottavolt swap. The Scaravolt coming in does put a ton of pressure um, onto Dave with Gaius to cover it. So now Dave's got to make a decision here. What do they do if Scaravolt comes in? Can they afford to ignore it long enough to bring down Gaius? What are they going to go for? As we do see, Kunders comes back with the Scara and it's Amphitheer, not Volfi. Uh, yeah, this... It's kind of uh, head games now, right? Because a crystal bite on Amphitheer is very effective, but into Volfi, not going to do very much at all. So it's it's a little bit of a play, but he does stay in, goes for the plague, takes the mirroring damage that comes with it. Eats a crystal bite as well, so that is already the end of the story of Amphitheer. Oh, and we do see the tenderness. This is a little bit slower than we were expecting. Not using it, opting not to use it on the move flank. Um, Gaius can purge that by swapping out due to the mechanics of chamomile. Um, and might be too little too late here. Volfi comes in. This Dave was with Sea Bite is on cooldown, but Hook Kick is up. And like you mentioned, uh, this is a bulky Volfi, so not the fastest him out there. Gaius just kind of covers it. And even at minus one attack, a hook kick is enough to bring Volfi down from here. Which means Gunders just goes for it, right? Click the attack. If Volfi leaves, then you can always swap out and come back later, get your attack back, and be prepared again. This is still going to be good damage on Volarend, especially if it's a double in. His hook kick does some damage. Pjap and Gialis. Again, yeah. it can just leave and come back, and it all goes away. Thunderstrike on Mushuk, though, trying to knock it down instead of the Volarend, doesn't quite get there, and just barely doesn't overexert, right? I think Scottifold just did a perfect zero stamina. Yeah, that's what we call some cold, hard, sexy math right there. Scaravolt getting to exactly 0%. Electric Storm is up and coverable by Double Gash, right? So uh, it's hard for Volfi to come into either slot, even if it won't take damage from Electric Storm. It's pressured out by double gash. So now Dave Goblino has got to make a very difficult decision here. Um, not a lot of Thames left that can threaten out Kunders' Riken. They can deal enough damage to the Volaren to bring it down. And man, it's looking really good for Kunders here. Yeah, the only real risk staying in, going for the double gash, means that a Feather Gatling might do a lot of damage to you. And if Gialis goes down, oh, but no, it's a plume. It's not a Feather Gatling, so just a little bit of poison on Scuttlebolt instead. Ah, oh, man, this Thunderstrike. It's going to do so much damage. Even though it's started to bulk itself up, it's down to 30% with quite a big OX on Scuttlebolt, but I think that he's okay with that damage because now Volfi has nowhere to go. It's forced to take this hook kick. Yeah, no swap outs, and then once the hook kick lands, we do have the OX, but then it's Riken time, right? Because the one thing Volderend can't handle particularly well is physical damage, and Riken has a lot of that, even though it's not the fastest Quetzalenya with the move flank out of commission. 
it is still a big bulky lion that does deal quite impressive damage if you let it. And Boulderand also coming in to help secure that KO with Feather Gatling. Hook Kick puts Volfi in the ground. And now we've got a mismatch here. Yeah, now it's even scarier too because a full HP Volaren just does beat a 30% Volaren. That's it doesn't matter what your buffs are. That's how that goes when you're both anaerobic, you're both with feather catlings. So game 1 pretty cleanly goes to Kunders on the back of a pretty strong Raiken lead. Well, I mean, yeah, 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 no, I didn't build to deal with a Raiken. I haven't seen a Raiken in 4 months. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Dave still goes for the Volfi ban initially. It's just a little bit too much for a lot of his Thames to take, despite having some decent counters, uh, being the likes of the uh, his own Volfi, Mashuk, or Noxolotl. But either way, I mean, it's it's still a pretty tough position. The Scottavold ban instead this time, allowing Oshiara to come through. Leading with Volaren though, so still a decent counter, but it does pressure out that Raiken move flank lead that Kunders used to such success in game one, potentially giving Dave an opening here. Uh, he, he's mousing over the Tolkien, but there has got to be no way that he's actually thinking about Tolkien, right? Well, you never know. They, they do need to create a situation where Amphitir feels uncomfortable. Uh, Scarable doesn't really want to come in. It could be Mirin Gaialis. I think that's maybe the most likely call here. Yeah, there we go. And on Dave's side, they are probably looking at uh, their own Tolkien. Actually, it does look pretty good for Dave here. I gotta say, this lead looks much stronger for Dave than the lead in game number one looked. Yeah, absolutely. This is using aggro to its full effect right now. Even though Gaialis Mirin is going to do some damage, I don't know if that matters all that, that much. I think getting rid of Gialis nice and early kind of protects Amphitir in a way that it uh, definitely wasn't protected in game one. If the second ban comes through being the Tolkien, I don't know. I think that the, the Volfi and Mushu combo is enough to counteract Raiken pretty well. Yeah, uh, one of the things that Kundus is kind of taking advantage of here is that they do have triple fire and Dave only has the one source of earth damage in Volfi and one source of water damage in Osiara. So uh, Dave actually has to be pretty careful what he does with this Osiara throughout the match because uh, if it does go down, uh, the rest of his team is ill-equipped to handle Scaravolt, Riken, uh, Mooflank kind of coming in in the back because as we see, no mentals on Dave's team. You know, the, the Nagais has been dropped, so Kunders can start to ban more around specifically other things that might deal with Mooflank and rely on it as it's sort of uh, reliable. It's always going to get value because of how it's built and how unnoticed works. Yeah, you either have to target it, allowing your other Thames to just have a lot of value, or you ignore it and allow Mooflank to get out of control, reach the point where its executions are essentially three prio. That's pretty terrifying. Yeah, uh, one of the really cool things about Mooflank, as we get into game number one here, one of the really cool things about Mooflank is that it is so strong against all of the stuff that people are throwing on their teams to counter special attacking aggro. You can beat two or three of those Thames just with one Mooflank, and that's one of the things that's been very, very powerful about it. Yeah, but he's got that in the back, though. It's not in the front, and in the front for Dave is a little bit scarier with that Oshiara Tolkien combo. Oshiara not in love with the idea of taking a double gash, mirroring damage, and Nox Bomb. But I don't know, without Raiken here, is it is it as necessary? I feel like, you know, Oshara would only have to do damage to Scatavolt, and there are a few other Thames here, you know, the Mushuk and the Noxolotl specifically, that could do that damage in its stead. Airbolt is such a powerful Tem with half full active, but you're right. The Toxic Ticks do do a great job of dealing damage through it, through its boosts. Osiara does need to deal damage here, but like you said, it's not it's not totally required. Although Osiara is one of the better Tems on Dave's side at dealing with Mooflank, so Dave may opt to save it. It may be correct to save it. Um, they have enough Tems that can deal physical damage, but the problem is Gaialis resisting Toxics means that Dave's three Toxics in the back are not super strong at dealing with Gaialis. 
And not everybody wants to swap into this field where they'd have to fight a Volarend. Uh, you know, it is burned right now, so it's got to have reduced damage. And it's likely not going to feather Gatling on turn one. But uh, it would still put them in a pretty difficult situation moving forward. The Oshiara swap for Kunders, though. Horse versus horse, double swapping, protecting Vola as well, straight for the move link. If this was potentially red, if there's double damage here, that's going to be pretty scary. The Tsunami, it is going to hit this move link. There is no one noticed for you, and down to 65%. Yeah, I really like that play from uh, David Goblino. Uh, the only way you get blown out on that turn is if both your water and fire moves hit into that Oceara. So wisely, he opts to spread instead, not letting Mooflank get any speed benefits. And also, really, this Oceara has to be careful. Mooflank goes for Cage, though, so who's locked in here with who, though? Dave does try to swap and gets trapped. Yeah, so if nothing else, that is a dead Tolkien from Aquatic Whirlwind. But Oceara did not try to swap. It wants to go for this Wrath. It wants to do so much damage to Mooflink. It wants the plus one special attack. Give all the power in the world to this horse. And it will see... It will use it and see it uh, in due diligence. It's, it's still trapped in. It's low on stamina. It's not going to be able to do anything right away without overexerting. But honestly, maybe Blizzard is enough, right? That Mooflink is pretty low now. What about Aquatic Whirlwind just coming into the um, Oceara. Like, uh, surely Dave has the speed arrow, so they probably move first. And with plus one special attack into an Oceara, it probably just brings its own brethren down. And Or it could target the move flank as well, but the tricky part is the Oceara will overexert and likely have to leave. It is Aquatic Whirlwind. And it will target the move flank, so bringing it down. Yeah. Yeah, a sizable overexertion, but still confirming the kill, confirming the prio. And a wrath of its own coming from Kunders, it's not going to do very much damage to either of these Thames. They're getting the plus one special attack, still with its Aquatic Whirlwind available for the next turn. Well, never mind, Toxic Ink is still here. That is a very dead horse. Yeah, um, one of the things that I've definitely been noticing more and more in Sapanku is that uh, the player who cages tends to lose the cage exchange uh, more often than I think I've ever seen before. Uh, and that's another case of it there, where that cage looked promising for Kunders at first, but very quickly became, a, uh, you know, became apparent that, I mean, now the OCR can just leave, and it has plus one special attack for its Aquatic Whirlwind. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason for it to stay in right now. I mean, really no reason at all. Scudavolt... Uh, if it if Scudavolt doesn't take damage right away, it has the ability to swap in and out a few times and uh, regenerate more of its HP. Especially if that Oshara leaves, Gialis comes in this turn. You know, there's nothing really that Noxolotl is going to do to a uh, an immune Gialis for one more turn. So that wouldn't be the worst play in the world for Kunders if he just wants to heal that Scudavolt a little bit, try to gain back some of the momentum that he lost from that cage. Coming in, just have the parrier. So Feather Gatling not dealing as much damage. Now on the other side, will Kunders they opt for this or Dave opts for the stare onto the Volaren. So that's a pretty clutch play. Uh, lowering the Volaren's defense is a great way to take it out later. Mashok takes Thunder Strike pretty well. And now Acid Reflux is online to spread some poison onto that left slot if Dave so chooses. But, you know, Kunder's dealing pretty sizable damage to Mashuk. Definitely not a situation that it's super happy about. Yeah, I wonder if this is just another stare on Devolarend. Um, if Mashuk is able to get an uppercut off, you know, depending on how these speed tiers are, typically Mashuk is a little bit faster. So if, uh, if that's the case, then it wouldn't be worth it. But the HKS on Mushuk has got some other things to say about it. But no, he holds on. Perfect jab on Scottavolt. Dropping that defense back down to neutral. Acid Reflex from Nox. Not going to take advantage of the P-Jab quality. 
but it is going to poison that Scatterbolt for two whole turns. It's exhausted. It's used its stamina to kill this Mashuk. But is that a perfect zero? Or has that overexerted? It was at 42. It does overexert way down to 30%. Man, HKS sucks now. Oh, man. <laughs> I thought for sure I thought for sure that Mashuk was toast. And then, nope. HKS finding new surprising ways to disappoint me. Um, so, yeah. Like you said, the, the, the Acid Reflex not taking advantage of it, but the Poison Ticks onto Scaravolt. Um, one of the things that is really good against half-full Scaravolt because of its buffs is the the pure damage that it takes from toxic ticks and now with stare in play uh onto this volarent uh, noxxolotl can keep staring it like a care bear and then uh volarent can come in with a feather gatling to, to pick up that ko yeah absolutely and it's <laughs> i i completely feel with you that the hks nerf this speed tier nerf it just hit these volarents so hard I, I understand they still have their value right now in this special attack meta. Just buffing up the special defense, it still counters quite a few of the Thames. But I don't know, that HKS is rough. I wonder if it's even worth running at this point. The Feather Gatling towards Vola brings it down to 50%. The stare comes afterwards. But that means another Feather Gatling is going to do that much more. Thunderstrike from Scottavolt. Won't be enough to kill this Volaren by any means, but does put it within range of a kill the following turn. But now, Scott of Volt, you just overexerted yourself into the poison territory, knocking yourself out of this battle and forcing Kunders into his final Thames. That card was a little bit glitchy. We saw a Mashuk in there, but it is a Kialis, I promise. Yeah, the spirit of the Mashuk lives on in us all, uh, is really what that, that card says. But yeah, uh... You know, Kundra's with the Macha on Volaren, it's good. You need to rest up so you can use 60% of your bar to deal no damage with HKS again. Uh, that's very important. Um, but of course, the Volarend actually having the option here to go in for Epgat onto a minus two defense Volarend is not something that you're super happy about if you're Kundra's. Although this Gaialis is well positioned to sort of take the game, it is going to have to contest a plus one special attack OCR Aquatic Whirlwind. Not a lot of Gaelises can take that and be super happy about it. So we'll see how the game progresses. Yeah, he'd be taking that. And if he doesn't take care of Noxolotl fast enough, those immunity turns are going to go away and he does not have resistance. He is going to take the full brunt of those toxic ticks. After the Oshiar is hit, that's probably enough to bring Gaelis down if it can even hang on that long. Yeah, it's a uh, oof. Not a great situation uh, for Kunders. The the tables have uh, turned tabled here, uh, for sure. Um, we'll see what the teamers do go for here, though. Is we can get quite a bit of damage onto this Vola. Oh no, not again, Kunders. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> the mad lad just yeah. barely enough, but now he takes a narco hit, and he's so hurt to begin with. This Volaren, 13% HP. This is looking really, really difficult. Um, I, I think uh, there's some hope here for, for Kunders. It mostly comes down to the fact that in order for the OCR to kill the Gaelis, it might actually have to KO itself on the on the mirroring. And that means that another Feather Gatling does have the option into Nox. And the Nox... Oh, but the Nox still has all of its like life support giving techniques available to it. Aquatic Whirlwind, Ooh. not enough. Not enough, and all of that crystal by going towards Oshiara. That had been a sharp stabs instead, keeping the stamina, keeping the strongest attack for this Nox Lotl next turn. That might have been enough, but no, now the Toxic Ink onto Volar and it takes itself down <laughs> this Gialis is all that is left for Kunders. It's definitely going to go out speed, but without Crystal Bite, it won't be able to kill. The Hook Kick is going to bring it into Trance. That's not going to impact the uh, defenses at all. And really, it's just that first aid kit. So now, oh, Gialis can overexert for a Crystal Bite, but is it going to be 52%? You up to rest. And now it's going to be Narcoleptic Hit versus... The Gialis here, because sharp it's going to be Sharp Stabs plus Crystal Bite, so Crystal Bite will come first, we'll see if it's enough. 
Although with the regen, it's unlikely that a combination of the two will be enough. Sharp steps comes out, so the Crystal Bite must have OX'd and... Oh, Acid Reflex. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Especially because it kills. And that's going to be it for game number two. We got a tie series. Yeah, one to one. Dave bringing it back against Gunders. Definitely found the answer that time with that incredible Tolkien Oshiara lead. There just wasn't enough left. That is That's uh, what I'm learning from watching these games so far. Uh, we are into the draft for game number three. Uh, we do need it on Plus's side, and here it is. So let's take a look. Uh, yeah, uh, Venom Claws and Volarend. That's uh, that's the play. Mooflank picked up first here from Kunders. Yeah, there we go. Mine was a little bit delayed, but uh, that move length's still really good. That's what we saw kind of get away with a lot of damage and a lot of uh, speed progress in game one. So picking that early was definitely a nice way to start things off with the Scudavolt. Ryken's not as happy. It means that he could only attack a Mushuk, and and that's that's probably not going to happen now. So the Quetzalenyo lead was uh, was defeated readily by Dave Goblino this time. Yeah, for sure, and it's a kind of a, a pretty good lead for Dave because not only does it beat the um, the Quetzalmenya lead, but it also looks pretty good into like Volarent. It looks pretty good into OCR, although Kunders does opt for the OCR, uh, likely trying to just bury the Scarabolt before it can get uh, anything going. But it does have to watch out, you know. The uh, no hurry wart on that move flank, so it can't cage turn one. Scarabolt can leave, and then the game gets a bit messy. So we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, because there are definitely some free swap-ins here for Dave with the Amphitir, with the Volarend, with the Noxolotl. Any of them could take this hit from Oshiara, so there's no way to ban it all out. Uh, getting rid of the Amphitir, it's nice. It gets rid of Sparks, it gets rid of Bright Beam, gets rid of a lot of speed, but not much else beyond that. Uh, I think it protects Tolkien more than anything else. Yeah, still get this. This is still a good-looking team for Kunders, but he's got to deal with Scottavolt, and without Volfi, I just don't know how that's going to work out. I think it all comes down to the turn one. If Oshiara attacks and Scottavolt leaves, the Dave Goblino might just have that. Yeah, uh, it's going to be kind of an interesting standoff here. I like Scottavolt as an answer into the Toxics almost more than Volarend at this point, just because of how much damage it can do up front. It doesn't suck against the ticks but offensively it makes more sense to me than after what i just saw hyperkinetic strike do um but not as we're into game three now N new, new thing uh we don't have double hurry wart lead unfortunately but we do have um double bipedal murder machine so we've got that going for us or quadrupedal mu murder machine yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. scarable leaves yeah noxalotl comes in so Voshiara stays Oh, it does. It goes for the Aquatic Whirlwind. This Noxolotl just doesn't care one bit. Wastewater back towards Oshiara brings it down to 45%, and the base jump on Nox is good damage. But I don't know. That was so much to take on Oshiara, and now Aquatic Whirlwind is gone. We would have to find a way to swap back in later. Against a team that has four Thames with effective damage, Oshira does not want to be swapping in. It would much rather come in off of a death. So that is a pretty difficult situation for Kuhn. There's right from the get-go, a lot of this game is going to come down to Mooflank and Gialis now. And they did force Dave to make that, that last pick on the token, so there is two targets for Aquatic Whirlwind. So I can understand why Kundris is going for a swap out here for sure. Being able to recharge the water shotgun and just go kablammo a little bit later, always a good time. As they're going to go ahead and turn on Trance and First Aid Kit here. So this Noxolotl effectively gains health from what that move flank just did to it. But with both of those things down, the option to go for the cage play into the Tornado is likely very tempting. But even then, Noxolotl having tons of special bulk now it might not be enough i think tornado plus a uh, base jump would be good but then you just leave it up for noxolotl to leave tolkien or scudavolt to come in and in that situation it would be down to dave goblino playing himself and staying in just because he expects the cage but i don't know it's still probably worth swapping for dave just because a cage means that 
Noxalotl would survive that turn at least. It's got two good swaps here, right? Like Tolkien comes in, resists a lot of what Tolkien can do, and Scaravolt can come in and resist a lot of what Tolkien can do. But this is maybe a little bit starting to feel a little bit similar to game number one, where Kunders is forcing Dave into these positions where he needs to kind of swap and pivot to not take damage from a Tem that's hitting on the type chart. And then off of the type chart, this move flank is just hammering and hammering and hammering. Like uh, in, in the, the Shining, you know, here's here's Johnny, just this, but it's a goat, right? Uh, at your door <laughs> over and over again. Yeah, plus two. It's it's definitely getting itself up there. I think it only reached plus two or three in game one, and that was still more than enough to just hurt everybody. It'll definitely outspeed everything else right now that Dave has with its Gorings. The base jump towards Mashuk isn't going to do very much, but the Tornado doubling in just wants to go for the kill. But no, Mashuk is built with too much special defense. It survives to uppercut again. Now Noxalotl wakes back up. This is looking a little bit better for Dave. Now uh, Kunders has to pick a target as uh, probably Noxalotl is, is pretty happy healthy at the moment. Kind of interesting play, leaving both Tims in for Dave, not going for any swaps at all. Maybe Dave was perhaps thinking there was a cage coming, but uh, man, if you look at this, like if this Mashuk goes down, all of a sudden the Oshiara can come back in and provide value. And now Mashuk can no longer resist the AWW very well. Here's the Scaravolt. Base jump comes in. Fiery Soul, at least, and... Wow, Kundra's splitting damage again. I mean, it's a little bit of nice damage on Skydevolt. It brings it down back below the 50% mark. Oh, man. But now Tolkien goes down. It was... It was a nice burn to knock off the region on Noxalot. I'll stop it from healing more. But it's still got a lot of HP back. This is still looking pretty difficult. I think... OCR is still so low, he doesn't want to come in here because Scottenfold can just leave again. So it almost forces either a Gialis into a spot where Fire Tornado is possible, or a Scottenfold who isn't really going to accomplish much. It really does feel like First Aid Kit was almost an item just built for Noxalotl, right? Like, without that 25% extra HP, it was so much easier for Kunrus to just throw wind moves at the Nox until it went down. But now it complicates the turns. And as these turns kind of work in Dave's favor over and over again, these Kundras has got to figure out a way to deal with the Toxics. I mean, I mean we know Volaren doesn't cut it, uh, and it didn't even come this game. So these Thames are going to have to figure out another way. Smooth Flank is finally starting to run out of gas, and that's bad news for Kundras. Yeah, absolutely. That means Kialis is going to have to be the one that makes it happen. But coming in on a death means it doesn't have any of its attacks up. It can only use a double gash. And a fire tornado will be a little bit too terrifying for this Gialis right now from Scudavolt. Yeah, I gotta say, you know, the adjustment from game one to game two here from Dave and game three uh, further has just been night and day. This is one of the things that Dave does really well as a player is they're very good in best of threes because they do adjust game to game uh, really well. You can see how they've not let Kundras, they didn't let Kundras have that Quetzalenyo opening anymore. And now uh, Kundras made a nice adjustment in game three, finding a way to get move flank more reps, ways to make it deal more damage. Um, and now it kind of comes down to how Kundras has built this Gyalis. If it's, you know, got the speed and it's got the damage to start to get in and start picking off different temps uh, with big damage, maybe Kundras can find a way back into the game here. Yeah, it really comes down to what he can accomplish. It's. It looks so scary. This move flank just needs more stamina. The good thing about this move flank is that all of its attacks are very low stamina cost. So 18% could go for a base jump, uh, potentially potentially without dying. Uh, you know, a double in on Noxalotl from that might be enough to kill. It's, it's just so scary. Uh, the fire tornado is the most terrifying thing here. Scudavolt has swept in and out a few times. And we've seen far too many plus one special attack Scottavolt's Oko Gialis with Fire Tornado. I wonder if, you know, if Kundras does feel like getting rid of the Scaravolt could be their ticket to victory. 
that uh, we do see some sort of combination of mirroring being used with that fire tornado to bring down the Scaravolt, but and if that happens, the Scaravolt is so cleanly checked by Volfi, it's going to be tricky. Dave does go for the swap, and Tolkien's coming in. Dave's saving that Volfi in the back for later. And the burn, ooh, that's going to reduce a lot of damage from Goring. Yeah, double gash. The, the immunity means he doesn't get burned. And the Thunderstrike on move flank means he goes down. It doesn't even take the burn and Toxic to kill. Thunderstrike will do it on its own. There was no mirroring damage there. It didn't target the Gialis. Scottavolt is still healthy. And now this Tolkien. Tolkien is free to do as it pleases. I think this is this is a pretty easy double in on Gialis' spot, right? Because now Oshiara comes in. It can probably kill either or of these Thames, but in the process, Kunders will lose Gialis. Dave is a little bit opened up here, though. Uh, if the token does go for Gialis, then um, a spread move like Zerbatio's Wrath will likely KO both Thames. So, Dave can't quite let that happen, and they actually don't have a lot of great swap-ins, other than the Volfi, which is then threatened by the Aquatic Whirlwind again, so Cervatio's Wrath is active. Depending on how fast Dave's Tolkien is, Gunders may have the opportunity to go for something here, but the Tornado from the Tolkien could shut that down. It's such an interesting back and forth, and see what the players go for here. Yeah, Gunders is kind of forced to click Wrath, I think, because he used Aquatic and then left, and just came in on death, so he does not have Aquatic available right now. And if it's a choice between Wrath or Tsunami, you click Wrath 100% of the time. In a balanced world, that would be the case, Rarzi, but Hurry Wart, of course, gives Oshiara oh, yeah. a right back. You're right. So oh, you don't God. Have to worry about that, yeah. Oh, this horse is so strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, rough for uh, Dave Goblino. But, like we said, uh, if the Tolkien does try to tornado the Oshiara, it's forced to whirlwind or it will pass away. So, Dave instead opting to switch. Hmm. Here comes the Meshuk, but man, if if Sorbatio's Wrath comes out here, even into the double out from Dave to the Volfi. Huh. Okay. Yeah, Aquatic Whirlwind instead. It targets down the Meshuk. It is enough to kill, but that means that Volfi goes unchecked by the really strong damage and no it's a crystal bite onto that spot he was hoping for the neutral damage towards scottavolt but no not today now there's nothing that oshiara can do to challenge this wolfie the plague will likely outspeed it kind of forces almost a 50 50 from gunders do you swap into scottavolt and risk the dv instead or do you think that you can kill Volfi the rest of the way with a single hook kick. I think that's a little bit too much to ask. Dave's uh, Dave's Volfi has definitely eaten its Wheaties, so there's no way that it's going to be taking a hook kick from Gialis and going down at 80%. Um, so I wonder if your Kunders, maybe you just have to sort of sacrifice your Oshiara here and, and hope that the Gialis after the second attack bringing down the Volfi and the Scarabolt can get enough value for Oshiara to be able to bring the game back uh, on the other side, although this Noxolotl is looking very scary uh, in that prospect. I I almost think Scottavolt is the better choice to keep. I, I'm not sure. This Oshiara, of course, just has so much potential value all the time, every single turn. But when Volfi is here and threatening death and he doesn't have any single target attacks left except for a blizzard, it's if Scottavolt can still fight Noxolotl and Tolkien very well, and that would clean things up so Gialis only has to worry about Volfi and Scottavolt instead of Noxolotl as well. No, it is the Scottavolt thrown out into the wind, hoping for a plague instead of a DV. But if Dave reads this, that might just be GG. It does come out, Volfi. Hate those Wheaties, and you see no plague, so what's coming? It must be, and it is the DV. Oh, but the other way, it targets the Gialis, and the mirroring takes out the Volfi. Well, that is not what I expected to happen, but... What a turn of events. 
it opens the door a little bit for Kunders here. It's now a three versus three. The HP advantage still in favor of Dave, but now Giala is still alive. Scottavolt still alive. Somebody is going to be taking some good damage here. If Tolkien comes in, the Thunderstrike kills. If Scottavolt comes in, a Crystal Bite will do decent damage. Really, really close game here. So the big problem for Dave now is that, like you said, if Scarvolt can't be KO'd, Tolkien doesn't have the punch to put it off to the side here. So Kunders now has a win condition. They just have to protect their Scarvolt, and they have two Thames that are going to be pretty good at doing that. Gaiawas does have sharp stabs, and that's likely faster than anything on Dave's side of the board. So if Dave goes to Scaravolt, then Kunders can go for a Crystal Bite on the Gaiawas into the Noxolotl to really severely weaken it. And then Scaravolt can follow up with a KO. That forces Scaravolt Tolkien versus Scaravolt Osiara. And Aquatic Whirlwind will go first and KO the Tolkien, leaving a Scara versus Scara matchup that likely favors, it could favor Kunders, but it might favor Dave. It's going to depend on what the fourth move is in that matchup. Some players like to run Earthbreaker as their fourth move, specifically for the mirror match. And if either one of these players run that, they win. Yeah, at the moment, Gunders does have Speed Arrow, so if it were to come down to that, and they're both the same Speed Skatskata, that could be the difference maker for Gunders to win, but that's that's asking for quite a lot. That's almost asking for Dave to sacrifice his Noxolotl, which I don't really expect him to do. The Skatavul, it's it's nice here. It means that Gialis has the target available if he wants to go for that. This is uh, such a crucial turn. I wonder if Kundras needs to pick up the KO on Noxolotl or Tolkien here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, 100% needs to kill whatever is in that other spot. Definitely, Noxolotl is the preferable one to kill, so Oshiara has its day in the sun with all of these fire Thames. But uh, it's I just don't think Dave's going to let it go. So if Gialis can pick up a t if the like Gialis attack and the Thunderstrike picks up a KO on Noxolotl here, it means that the end game board state is Tolkien Scaravolt likely versus Scaravolt Osiara. So the Osiara can Aquatic Whirlwind the Scaravolt, and the Scaravolt can Thunderstrike the Tolkien, and that should be a win for Kunders. But they do swap. Does Kunders call this out and go for the T Strike? That's a double gash towards Tolkien. It's an electric storm. So that will be enough to bring Tolkien down. Scottavolt still holding on pretty healthily. And the E-Storm as well from Scottavolt. So if this is enough to kill Kialis, no, it holds on just a little bit longer. The mirroring damage as well. This is starting to look up for Kunders right now. If he can crystal bite. You know, the double gash meant he didn't overexert. He could potentially kill Noxolotl here and then have Oshiara left for Scottavolt. Yeah, just a complete call out there by Kunders, right? Not going for the move that would OX them in order to preserve the Gaialis, expecting Dave to not have the offensive pressure into Gaialis on that turn, and they end up being correct. So now the board state could even favor Kunders here. Crystal Bite comes out. That's the self knockout on the Gaialis, though. That doesn't oh, mean it's terrible. Ink. It's not enough. Fire Tornado, will this KO? Yes. Huge turn there. Now, back the other way around. In comes ETE. Plus one special attack. It has Tornado. Sorry, it has Tsunami. It doesn't have access to Servatio's Wrath. Does plus one tsunami KO these temps? It, I don't think he is plus one, is he? Did he ever click wrath? No. Nope, yeah, he he's wrath now. saved, so we can click it this turn. If this is enough, enough, it's gotta kill Noxolotl, but it's plus two from the trance. It oh, oh no, Scottable hangs on on one HP or two oh, HP the and the thunder strike. That oh. is a dead horse, and that is Dave Goblino taking Boy. the series back two to one with two HP. What a game! Wow! Right down to the wire. Both players with some great plays. And Dave just hangs on just enough to win game number three. Go looking at those sparklies. We've got the Tolkien and the Barnshia Neko side. 
followed up with the Mushuk on Paduk side. If it comes down to Sparkly versus Sparkly, I think Neko wins in that bout. But definitely still a lot of attempts to kill in order to get the Sparkly v Sparkly. I, I just hope that that happens. Yeah, so looking at these teams, so Neko Blocky along with, I would say, Ali and Fulik have probably set at the sort of, and Lila as well from Yep, sort of kind of set the meta standard for these special attack aggro teams. And you can see they've got the core here. We call it the, uh, almost like the Power Rangers, uh, but no Volfi on uh, um, Neko Blocky's side in this particular variant of the team. On Paduk's side, you don't usually see very much Size Munch or Golzi as much anymore. And to do that with Naga Ragnit, this is definitely a slower, bulkier, more pace control team trying to live these attacks and hit back with tons of damage. See Paduk opening up the Golzi here. Not a common first pick. I do really like this Golzi. The only real direct counter to it would be a Soil Steam from Mudred. Definitely without speed and probably Oko if we're being perfectly honest. So that would force a swap if Neko wanted to go that route. But that also means Mudred has to stay in and take any of these other potential hits from, you know, quite a bit of melee in the back with both Mushuk and Size Munch or a Stone Ball from Turok. And now with Tolkien being picked, oh yeah, Turok would have been nice up until that Plague joined the party. Uh, Mushuk, though, bringing his own Luma and Paduk, that's not a bad choice. Uh, that means that you could potentially P-Jab Sparkling Bullet the Tolkien or just go straight for some wastewater shenanigans on Amphitheer. Yeah, so one of the things that I've kind of learned about Golzi through talking with some of the players who's been playing it, J-Dragon's played a lot of Golzi lately and some other players earlier in the meta as well, is that you can't really prepare for everything that you your is going to run into. Um, I wonder if this is, you know, a Golzi that might be itemized or... TV spread in such a way that it does well into the special attack that Paduk is going to be up against. Um, but if it's not, then it could be pretty ineffectual here. We'll have to see. But the synergy on Size Munch, Size Munch staring down a plague, but still picked out is a bold. That's a bold strategy, Cotton. We'll see if it pays off for him. Yeah, I mean, what synergy would he actually have right away, though? He gets the show off synergy, but Sparkling Bullet needs neutral, so he wouldn't have the higher damage for Tolkien. Thinking the size much wreck is the synergy that Paduk is probably going for pairing. Oh, he's, he's got to hang on two turns for that. That might be yeah. asking a little bit too much in front of a plague. Yeah, but if there's any team out there that Paduk has specced this size much goalsy lead to work against, it's this team. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Nekoblaki goes for and if Paduk is prepared for it. In fact, so. I think this lead is going to be super interesting to watch. Yeah, quite a lot of these Thames on Paduk's side are kind of counters for some of what Neko has. Uh, I think the the real challenge is going to be taking down Barnshi with really only the Ragnet here, because at, at this point, I think a Beta Burst plus anything else would be enough to bring Golzi down 95% of the time. Uh, so, you know, leading with goals, meaning that you might take some damage early on, that mental prowess of Bardenshi might be a little bit too much for Paduk to handle. But we will have to see. It all depends on these first couple of turns, who takes what damage, as they both do counter each other pretty well. We'll see with the camo meal, but it doesn't even matter. You're eating the heater anyways. Um, but the camo one, it does mean that further statuses will not be applied, so it can't be trapped in. What will this Golzi plan to do? This is, I again, even though we're in the same club, I have not seen a lot of Paduk's games, and I'm so interested. What is he, what's he up to, right? Like, why why Golzi size munch into this lead? You know, he's on blue, so he saw the Amphitir and was like, yes, I want size munch. So I'm so interested in what, what, is, what is he going for? You know, Golzi Size Munch is something I've used to great effect in the Sepunku Dojo, but in a comp match is a little bit different. There's a bit more variety there. And Luffy just learned that firsthand, taking a plague down to 38%. Reactive Vile is some pretty spicy tech, though, means that the heat up is here. Luffy probably not going down next turn. Sparkling Bullet onto Gialis is resisted, but at least it doesn't give mirroring damage back to Golzi. We do see that 
Seismunch Wreck is online now. Um, and the Heat Up is online as well. This is, uh, all of a sudden... Neko Blackie has to take it neutrally on somebody. But... And thanks to the neutralized status, Seismunch does sort of get this off and... Look out! He's heated up, it's Fismus! Oh my god, that Amphid tier all the way down to 9% means that even if Golzi goes for a Sparkling Bullet, it probably kills, but a Thunder Strike towards Luffy, now that it's going to be neutral damage, it's going to do so much more, but still not enough to kill right away. The Oshi Dashi just going for gold. Amphid here goes down, and Paduke, despite potentially having the worst lead, just cleared the board. Yeah, I think if you're Neko Blocky, she might be kicking herself a bit for for swapping out that token and not just staying in to try and put that pressure on. And yeah, you can see right away there's the there's the forfeit, and Paduke picks up the win in game number one solely off of that lead. Dad used to say to me when I was a kid, he said, "When you're number one and you're winning everything, there's only one way for you to go." And people start game planning and planning for what you're doing, and we see Paduke. Now with the Naga Band out, brings in the Volakala lead. Not a lead we're commonly seeing in this meta. Again, things a little bit weirder on Paduk's side. It's It still works, though. It's decent. It uh, definitely pressures out the Oshi... <clears throat> excuse me, the Oshi R on turn one. And with the uh, potential Ice Stalactite or Aqua Stone, since there is some Earth there on Paduk's side, it could be good pressure towards Tolkien on turn two. The problem is Calibus has to find a way to survive Windburst Tornado for that water attack to hit. And that might be asking too much since we know that Reactive Vile is instead with the Size Munch and not with Calibus. Yeah, the uh, the bad dragon tech from Jay Dorigon on the Calibus won't be present in this match. So uh, we are going to have to see if the Reactive Vile Calibus, uh, sorry, the Reactive Vile on the Size Munch. So is this Calibus coat maybe? some sort of tech to help it survive wind moves to, to make this a more valuable lead. Very interesting also we see from Paduke, they're not hesitant at all to pick Ragnet. Typically, a lot of players get frustrated with Ragnet and drop it from their team because they can't find ways to make it work outside of Deceit Aura. But Paduke seems rather confident in the Tem and has brought it again here. It is pretty decent into this lineup. Mudrid would have been a bit more of a hard counter, but really, Gyalis is the only one here that is going to destroy Ragnit. Everybody else kind of doesn't want to fight it. P-Jabs are a lot to handle. Piezoelectric Blow would probably Oko both Oshiara and Tolkien, as well as do quite a lot of damage to Mashuk. So it's... It does have its values still. It's it's just a little bit slow, a little bit uh, tough to maneuver sometimes. But on a much more physical team like what Paduk has with so many melee Thames, it does have a little bit more advantage. Yeah, you gotta wonder though, without this reactive vial, oh man, Calibus is really gonna be in tough trying to withstand these hits. Uh, and just looking at the draft here, it does look like Nekoblocky does have the potential to just kind of run over Paduke's lineup with the special attacks here. The wind damage, uh, the electric damage without electric custodian, and the nature damage makes a pretty brutal combo, but we'll see what Paduke opts for in response here in game number two. Yeah, losing the Naga means that it is more difficult. He can't just freely swap in Ragnar on turn one and expect E-Punch to do anything. But a couple of swaps do come through. Turok and Mashuk find their way onto the field. Definitely a good call uh, predicting the Oshiara to leave, as it was just a little bit too pressured out. So Turok takes the hit like a champion, knocks bomb towards Tolkien, does more damage, but not by much. The big difference maker there is the plus special defense on Angry Burb, just trying to set itself up, fight the good fight against this Tolkien in the future. Yeah, I gotta say, Eve. Even with the 1080p, the, the blur from the brightness on this token is... Wow. Uh, it is. It looks like uh, one of those reflective jackets, so paparazzi can't take photos of, uh, of things. So that's uh, that token does kind of feel like it needs to leave now, though, right? Like, it's not going to get a lot done against anaerobic Volarend. 
Yeah, it's not very happy against the stone balls either, but it does stay. Goes for the fiery soul, just wants the damage while the damage is good. An uppercut as well. Angry Burb down below 50%. Feather Gatling onto Mushuk is not going to hit super hard, but the double Feather Gatling is going to hit quite a lot harder, especially when you take into consideration Turok's massive attack stat. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, do we see Parrier propped on that on that Mushuk? I, I think it was Parrier, right? Uh, it needed to be there. It was cooked. Oh, yeah, if that was tireless. We would have no longer had a Mushuk on this field. Yeah, although I gotta say, once again, Volaren just being a little bit disappointing here. It's supposed to be building up these buffs, right? But uh, Nicoblocky seems totally happy to just leave the token in and burn it. That burn likely being the difference between life or death for that Mashuk. And it just continues to put Volaren in this tough spot where it it's hard pressed to contribute. The difficulty right now for Volaren, I feel, is that in so many of the matchups where it wants to fight, it would much rather use Feather Gatling than Nox Bomb. It's fighting a lot of toxic Thames very often. It's, you know, even something like a Gialis or a Wolfie. Feather Gatling is going to cost less stamina, so you can continue to do it more often. And it's going to deal the same damage into the neutrals and even more into the toxic. So it's it doesn't yeah. make as much sense, I guess. Yeah, you know, and you don't really benefit from your trade in those instances. Not only that, but I mean, Volarend has less stamina than me chasing an ice cream truck down the street. So it's like, you've got to put so many points into it just to get any sort of value. Uh, as we do see Amphitur coming in for the Mushuk. Uh, and wind Burst, yeah. Volarend will take the Wind Burst. Nox Bomb, fired back in. Oh, yeah. but then Nox Bomb onto Tolkien instead of the Amphitur, so it was not red from Paduk. The Rockfall, though, that's going to be a lot of damage on the Tolkien, not actually as much as I was expecting. Wow, that is a uh, decently bulky Tolkien, I guess, survives in the red on 22. And Amphitir actually probably took more damage than Tolkien did. Yeah, and man, it's a, it's a tough going for Paduke here. I think they really wanted to get this Tolkien out of the way earlier. It, it's so tough for some of those Thames in the back, like Calibus and Mushuk, to function if Amphitir is still alive and as a threat. And now with Tornado up, Nekoblocky does have the option of just leaving on this token and coming back in later to abuse its prio moves. We do see Amphitir in play here. Will it threaten these Thames? Turok does leave. Yeah, Ipo v Mushuk does find its way back onto the field. A Bright Beam, not going to do very much damage at all, but protecting Amphitir is nice. And the Wind Burst onto Angry Bird, finishing it off means Paduk has no damage output this turn, and Amphitir just takes its time, it heals itself up, it keeps its uh, bamboozle, its evasion for the following turn. Amphitir's pretty good to go. Yeah, and almost any Tem is not good to go on Paduk's side, right? Like, we really have just Ragnit. It's the only Tem that comes into this board state safely. Otherwise, there could be a massive overexertion on Neko Blackie's part, but Tolkien, with that hand fan, has the option to just burst some wind on some idiots or go for the tornado instead. So we'll see what it's going to be. Yeah, that's definitely the unfortunate part here is, uh, you know, Paduk, he really, <laughs> the Turok is needed to fight some of the Thames in Neko back. Neko's back line, the Gialis to be specific, but with Amphitir here, it just can't. There's there's no hope of it surviving multiple plague turns to get any attacks off on Gialis. Right now, if Tolkien were to stay, Turok is able to bring that down with a hard-hitting stone ball, but then, I don't know, Turok's taking more than half HP from the single plague, even with no sparks on Amphitir, and that means Gialis is looking so much stronger. The one benefit for Paduk in this turn is that it's not a great board state for OCR to come into, obviously with uh, a Mishuk next to the Turok. So the plan, which is was to have OCR handle Turok, is something that they're going to have to do off of a death, and Calibus is a great swap in uh, to deal with OCR as well. We will see Calibus come in here. Yeah, Tornado does come through towards this Mishuk though, so it's going to do massive damage way down to nine percent it takes itself out in the process but i don't know that was still probably worth it for tolkien 
the double in as well means Mashuk goes down. Amphitir gets another rested, or I'm sorry, relaxed proc, heals itself all the way back up. And now, I mean, it doesn't want to stay in front of this Calibus, but it can easily leave as there are more Thames in the back, you know, specifically a Chamomile Gialis that just doesn't care. Yeah, this Calibus is likely how Baduke is going to get most of the way back into the game if they do. It's got a great tight matchup into Osiara, a decent one into Amphitir. The Gialis is a bit of a problem, like you said, but they do have two rock in the back that can that can maybe contend with it. But we do see Osiara come here. Did Paduke guess right or wrong? Oh, wrong answer, Paduke. And in comes the two rock, which is not a fan of dealing with Osiara here. So a loss of tempo for Paduke as they're going to have to swap out. Yeah, these are the two Thames that Turok really does not want to fight. Uh, but swapping Shock Me into this means that it's going to take quite a lot of damage. It's going to be slower. So you could potentially expect four attacks onto Shock Me. Or even swap the Gialis in for Amphitir, have Crystal Bite available next turn. It, it would take quite a bit. I don't know. I think Turok really at 84% probably just survives Oshiara alone. But that's it really a big is, risk. It really is one of the reasons why um, people are kind of frustrated with Ragnet and why Oshiara is really at the top of the meta right now is a lot of the electric counters can't swap in, take a hit, and then take another hit. They also can't outspeed. So Paduka is actually forced to give up this Turok because if Ragnet swaps in, it's going to be useless. It's going to take a water move, and then it's going to take another water move, and it's probably going to be dead. And the Bright Beam dodging the Toxic Ink, so Nekoblaki absolutely dancing right now. She is multiple steps ahead of Paduke right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think, unfortunately, the Toxic Ink had to go into Oshiara, but it just wouldn't have mattered, because if Amphitir didn't go down, then you lose it anyway. The Thunder Strikes and the Plagues would just be too much over time on Calibus. Yeah, it looks like Bullerenda banned out now. By Paduke. They are hovering this Kala and the Golzi. They're back on blue. So they do have the option to pick size much here, perhaps. Will be Golzi opened up. I'm not sure though. I feel like uh last time Paduke got it off and it was very cool and spicy tech, but you don't get to accomplish the exact same play against a, someone of the caliber of Neko Blocky twice. You know, she's she's going to learn from that mistake. She's going to do something different. And it's probably not going to go as smoothly for Paduke as it did in game one. Uh, definitely not as smoothly as outspeeding the Amphitir and getting the kill on Gialis. I think that was very unexpected for Neko. I, thought, I think she expected to be faster on both Thames. And it just wasn't so in that instance. But with this lead now... The Mudred is definitely scary for Golzi. It outspeeds the double and probably definitely kills. It, it's it's still risk, though. I mean, if if Golzi survives and uses Uppercut, Mudred is also very dead. Very interested as to why Padu didn't pick size much there. Um, the double does deal with Golzi, but he has other synergies potentially in the back to help size much out. And that was almost a free heat up. Um, that he passed up there. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. Um, the Turok is, like, type chart-wise, a pretty safe pick into the Mudred, but now Nekoblaki can kind of just leave. And now, all of a sudden, Paduka is going to be playing, like, a hot potato with uh, which way the Golzi goes, what does it target. It's just a very interesting um, no pick on the size muncher. As you can see... Neko is deciding whether to take away size's synergy or the size itself. Reserve time dropping low. Either okay. way, it would be okay. Getting rid of the size is good. It, it, getting rid of the wreck, getting rid of the heat up right away. I think getting rid of the synergy would have had the same effect, though. Uh, it, it just makes it a little bit easier now not having to fight a reactive vile tem, right? Size Munch is deceptively strong into Neko Blocky's team as well because not there are Tems that resist it, but those Tems aren't pivot Tems. They're not Tems that you're like, I'm going to swap my Osiara into Size Munch's rec, right? At plus two, like, you can do that. But if you get called out, your Osiara is dead, right? So Size Munch actually kind of has a sort of deceptive strength on, on Paduke's team. And I think it's a really smart ban by Nekoblocky, and I suspect 
that Paduk is going to wish they had that size munch at some point um, throughout the series. Yeah, you're you're dead on with the the pick of Turok second. Uh, you know, it's it is the counter. It, it would kill Mudrid, but that means Mudrid would have to stay in. And there's really no downside to swapping in a Mushuk or the I mean Amphitier would take a little bit more damage, but Mushuk or even the Barnshi potentially uh, wouldn't be too terrified right away. The the problem is Barnshi versus Golzi is awful, but uh yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of safety in Neko Blackie's backline with the Mushuk back there that just, it, it doesn't quite mind, and, and it would set Paduk back quite a bit. Yeah, as we see the attempts kind of get rounded out here, um, only the Tolkien really picked out yet to deal with those Toxics, but Neko does have the option to go for the Barnchi, and that is a snap pick Barnchi there. That is uh, decisive from Neko Blackie. So we get into this third and deciding game of the set. Yeah, thankfully, this time we are spectating from Paduk's corner, which means we aren't going to be blinded by the Luma Tolk in the same way again. Because uh, definitely, that, that's what you sell to someone to put on top of their license plate. So you just can't yeah. take pictures when they oh. run a red light. <laughs> it's uh, just far too bright. I'm pretty sure you get pulled over for high beams if you uh, have that Tolkien in your, like, in your car with you as you drive. All right. So... We do see the, the double heater coming out again before the goal Z can get off chamomile. Um, this Mudrid has Paduke Calc to live a soil steam plus another attack. It seems so unlikely, right? It would be a very specialized spread. He does survive the soil steam, but the wind burst instead of a fiery soul it means goals he does survive to get the uppercut on Mudrid and Oko right away. The times four. Just a little bit too scary. The stone ball is well under Tolkien. Is going to do a nice chunk of damage despite the burn. And that worked out pretty well from Paduk. Despite not having the size much, not having the heat of potential, still gets the nice kill on Mudrid and nice starter damage towards Tolkien. I am, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm shocked that the goals he stayed in on that. Like, that is, I mean, I'm sure Neko Blocky is too, right? <laughs> like, uh, that was an absolute, like, I, th this Golzi has absolutely no fear. Um, oh my goodness, right? Firely Soul surely does the job if Golzi stays in there. I can't imagine Paducah's calc that. But that puts them up early on in this game. Ah, but imagine, imagine that the size much heated up on the, that same turn, right? Yeah, that would be terrifying then, as Amphitir would even be at risk. Uh, we saw how much it did last time. It, Amphitir barely held on, but not by very much at all. And since the plague would likely have to go towards that other spot, in this instance, it was the Turok. There's no reactive bile to be had, so it's going to hurt. And another wind burst brings Golzi down before it can attack once more. So another stone ball targeting Amphitir. It does more than half. But that's a big sacrifice. You lose a Tem, you almost lose Turok in the process. And you gave the HP advantage back to Neko Blacky just barely. One of the tough things about needing to run the Chamomile on a different Tem, like Golzi, some people are running out on Yowler as well, uh, or the Gayalis with Mirroring, is you do give up Chamomile on Turok. And without that, that plagues are so difficult for Turok to deal with. And Amphitir. Puts it in that overexerted state, and all of a sudden, Neko Blocky has kind of wrestled the driver's seat back away from Paduk in this game. Yeah, it was a fantastic job. Angry Burb coming in is at least a nice counter for the Amphitir, but wants to stay in. It will go down to an Ox Bomb. Unless Tolkien, or yeah, unless Tolkien kills Turok and Amphitir just goes for a Bright Beam, there's not too much that Paduk could do to stop that. And he really doesn't want to swap in one of these other Thames because both of these Toxics are taking so much damage from Tolkien. And really, even the Barnshee in the back line for Neko Blacky kind of counters everybody that's left here. The even if spam is more than enough to fight Volarens, even if they're plus five. And Barnshee just wins against Calibus and Mushuk. So we do have Paduk in the chat saying that they helped to live fiery soul there so on the on the goalsy so we do get confirmation that uh that would actually have been a a a, a good play uh if they had gone for fiery soul as well so volo going for the noctis bomb here 
not targeting the Amphitere, so not getting called out by the Bright Beam. Calib is coming in as well. I like the swap for uh, Paduk. They will take a lot of damage on Kala, but it does sort of threaten out both of these Thames. Yeah, for sure. Now the double Toxic is more than enough to pop and kill Amphitere, as well as anything water-related with Tolkien only at 47% would go down. I doubt that Calibus could die even from a double in of Tornado and Thunderstrike right now. It is just a little bit too bulky. So Neko does retreat towards this Gialis instead, which still takes some good damage if a water technique is used, but Paduke with the big brain reads, maybe swapping Turok back in. It all depends, though, if this Amphitere stays, it uses Thunderstrike onto Angry Burb, so that is some nice damage. But now so low on stamina and exhausted, it might not want to go for the Plague, but that would just be too risky, right? Letting Stoneball hit Gialis like that? I think the plague is kind of oh yeah like you mentioned the, that's a big ox to take out the turok but that might be just the play that neko blocky wants to do like you said stoneball going into gaius i think is one of the few ways that neko can kind of lose from here right the gaius is so strong it doesn't take super effective damage from anything else so really the first priority for neko is taking out the turok however the gaius itself can accomplish that right with hook kick active Definitely a possibility that the Gialis just takes out its own trash here, and the Amphitere swaps out for something else, maybe the Tolkien, to help accomplish that feat. Yeah, Turok's HP is a little bit too low at this point. That's always been a struggle that i found with the big rock bird, is that as much damage as it does and its typing tends to work out well for some things, in other ways, it just can't do it because it's so slow if it takes 50% damage from an attack, then it usually dies before it accomplishes what it needs to. And that's what we're seeing right here. The hook kick brings Turok down. A couple of swaps means that Mashuk is staring down a barn she, so he's not very happy. And there's really no way for Paduk to easily clean up this barn she now. So uh, this, this might just be battle of attrition GG for Neko as a little bit too much wind with both Tolkien and Barnshi still alive. And even Amphitere going for uh, Thunderstrikes on Calibus and Angry Burb. It, it's a little bit too much for Paduk. Yeah, I, I think the couple of swaps that have really been big here. I mean, the most recent one, just swapping the Barnshi into this board instead of giving up the Amphitere. Very smart. Uh, Nekoblocky's positioning this game has been very, very effective. And it's forced Paduk into some very tough spots. Uh, I think Paduk not really getting much value out of their lead compared to the previous matches. And... That's making it a bit difficult for them to have the sort of impact they want to have in this game. Yeah, I mean, specifically here, the lead was nicely done, but it just wasn't in a in a situation. It wasn't Thames that could capitalize and continue the momentum into turn two. So the tornado, the crystal bite is enough to bring Mushuk down before it can even attack. Angry Burb at only 18 percent means that even though it gets this Nox Bomb off, it gets another plus special defense, it's still going to go down next turn. And Barnshee really is still safe. I, I don't think that that's too much of a problem. Uh, at this point, even just doubling in the Calibus spot once more isn't a bad decision, uh, but I, I would like to see the sharp stabs. Yeah, just just take Volarin down, not have to worry about it. This is uh, also, again, just another uh, anti-advertisement for Volarin, as it goes into a team before special attackers and really almost has no impact throughout this entire game like it, it it doesn't get the anaerobe buffs up going anywhere close to fast enough gayalis gets on the board against it and it just melts uh not a great not a great few games showing for volarend i must say um i mean very interesting um on that thames down goes the calibus and that'll be it for the series nekoblocky taking game number three yeah, I think Volarend has definitely had its time in the sun. It's it's just fallen off a little bit too hard. It's taken one too many nerfs. And